Hey, Stan. Hey, Axel. So let me just stop my placeholder. I stand by so. Are we ready to start? Um, yeah, it looks everything's online. YouTube is online. Webinar. We have okay. a few people attending. Yeah, so there's like 20 more on YouTube already. Were you guys able to see my my uh, slide? Yes. I couldn't. Uh, I was a bit uh, disoriented. I'm. I'm going to try that again. Let's see. Okay. So is it in full screen mode now? Yes. Okay, cool. I guess that will work. How's my audio? Is it okay? Yeah, it's good. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good morning, Boris. Great Good morning, Boris. All right, well, let's get started. Welcome everyone to our uh, eighth biannual LAMPS Users Workshop and Symposium. Um, we remind everybody to please use Slack to answer questions or to ask questions. Um, if you need a Slack invite, you can email us at developers at lamps.org. Um, and uh, 
We're pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, Boris Kaczynski. Uh, Boris is the Thomas D. Cabot Associate Professor of Computational Material Science at the Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. He studied at MIT for his Bachelor of Science degrees in uh, looks like four degrees, physics, mathematics, electrical engineering, and computer science. And he also received a PhD degree from in physics from MIT as well. Uh, he established the computational materials design team at Boss Research. And then in 2018, he started working at Harvard. His group develops uh, electronic structure, molecular dynamics, and machine learning methods for understanding ionic, electronic, and thermal transport. Um, and so welcome, Boris, and we're excited to hear your talk. Thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation. Let me share my slides. Okay. Are they showing up okay? Yeah, they look great. Excellent. And the mouse is moving, right? Yes. Awaken points. Okay, great. Okay, so um, yeah, so uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we can scale molecular dynamic simulations with lamps by using some of the new types of force fields, which are based on ideas from machine learning, and um, we give them name, Bayesian or equivariant, and I'll explain what these means. These are sort of specific capabilities that these force fields have to make life easier for simulation uh, workflows. So to start off, of course, the, the big challenge uh, in our material science world is we want to understand how atoms move in heterogeneous catalysis settings. For instance, surface restructuring can be very complicated and requires simulations uh, that are quite long and quite uh, complicated. If you bring in reacting species to catalysis uh, scenarios, that can even lead to restructuring of the surface and then, of course, affect the catalyst back. So there's a lot of coupled dynamics going on. Similarly, in batteries, there's a lot of complexity in how ions move through amorphous polymer electrolytes or how decomposition happens at interfaces in solid state batteries. These are all problems that uh, are essentially technologically unsolved and maybe even unsolvable without uh, large accurate molecular dynamic simulations. But there's a bit of a gap in capability. Uh, we can do calculations uh, with density functional theory to obtain energies and then forces to move the atoms in molecular dynamic simulations but these are very slow. So to answer some of these technology questions, there is really uh, 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 no uh, quantum or even old classical model that is capable of both accuracy and speed at the same time. And this is where machine learning comes in. Essentially, the idea is that you do regression uh, in complicated functional spaces that are essentially predicted by quantum mechanics to get yourself a energy as a function of atomic positions and then take derivatives to get forces and use those forces to move atoms around at quantum accuracy but at much, much lower computational cost. And uh, this is the idea of machine learning force fields. And so what we're trying to do essentially here is to, on this map of computational speed versus transferability and accuracy, is to move from sort of this fast classical potential paradigm to a domain of machine learning force field paradigm at the same or similar cost, but at the accuracy close to the uh, sort of quantum training data. Semi-local density functional theory is typically what we use for training, but um, uh, we can also envision in the future uh, developing better density functional theory methods based again on machine learning, starting from quantum chemistry, and then taking those and training machine learning force fields on those to get, uh, again, achieve increase in accuracy, but hopefully without sacrificing computational cost. So we're moving this capability to the right to access these large, complicated systems. And so the workflows uh, that involve machine learning potentials are essentially, uh, you know, you take some models, some architectures of how you're going to approximate DFT data to get your energies and forces. And I'll talk about these two classes of methods that we're developing. It all starts with, you know, well, where you get the training data. The training data you generate with DFT, but you need to select which structures to run with DFT. Then you need to decide which parameters to put in the models. Then you need to train the models. Then we put these models in uh, lamps. This is a key enabler of running large simulations. So we write bare styles, essentially, of these machine learning models. Um, we put them in lamps, do molecular dynamic simulations. We look at what happens in these simulations. 
Uh, and based on what we see and how we compare with experiment, we may refine either the model architecture or generate additional quantum data uh, so that the force fields are more accurate. And you repeat this loop a couple of times. So what is the first, the left uh, method called flare? Let me just give you a little bit of background there. So the idea, the motivation was when you do a chemical simulation, uh, you need to take care of rare events. Rare events essentially are the ones that govern your chemical reactions or phase transitions. And these are unlikely to be in a training set that you just randomly generate uh, or generate using molecular dynamics without any bias. So what most likely will happen if you just run ab initio molecular dynamics as you're training a data generation procedure, you will end up sampling a lot in the basins with lots and lots of sort of frequently visited configurations. And you will not see anything in the rare configuration space, these red points here in the middle, but those are the ones that actually drive the chemical process. So to sample in a clever way so that you can actually have training data in the rarely transitioned regime, you would want to have a way of measuring distance between configurations. In other words, one configuration looks new if it's not similar to something that's already in the training set. And so this can be done with a class of techniques in machine learning called kernel methods. A kernel is essentially a metric, a distance between some descriptor of your atomic configuration and another atomic configuration, also represented by descriptor. A kernel tells you how far these are. And so based on this kernel regression, uh, you can predict the energy, you can predict force essentially uh, by uh, giving the model lots of training data. And this, uh, to each training point, the model knows how to compare the distance with respect to a test point on which you're trying to predict. And then you can predict the mean, uh, let's say, local energy and from that local, uh, I guess, atomic forces. And uh, this is something that uh, you can also do in a Bayesian way. And this has a name of Gaussian process regression where not only the mean, but also the variance of the prediction is available. In other words, you draw multiple ways of regressing through the data, multiple Gaussian process instances. And um, uh, since it's a statistical kind of picture, you can look at the variance or the spread. And typically, if you're far away from a training point, your variance will be larger. And that's exactly the uncertainty that you want. If it's if a point is new, then um, uh, the model will give you a high uncertainty or high variance of the prediction. So then on a technical level, very quickly, what you can do is you can encode the structural information in some sort of a descriptor. Uh, there is a lot of choices here. Uh, what we do is uh, we use the atomic cluster expansion, a very sort of rigorous formalism of how to represent structure in a finite dimensional uh, feature vector. And then these feature vectors are the ones that become descriptors uh, and they're fed into this kernel formalism and Gaussian process regression. So this is uh, references here at the bottom. And this uh, can encode the species information and the geometric information. A key feature of Flare is also that it doesn't need to loop through the training set to predict a force, let's say, on a configuration that uh, is new and it needs to compare to everything in the training set. That's a typical procedure in Gaussian process regression, but we bypass it by a clever reordering of the indices using a particular structure of the kernel of this way of comparison between descriptors, such that the prediction <clears throat> can be essentially constant cost as a function of the training set size. This is very, very important for fast molecular dynamic simulations because every time you want to predict something, you want to just evaluate, let's say, quadratic function uh, and not uh, loop over the entire training set, which may be tens of thousands of points. So this is what we call mapping. And uh, uh, it doesn't lose any accuracy. It just basically makes your calculation faster building on a particular structure of a kernel. And so now you have a force field that is fast. Uh, that is sort of uh, uh, accurate also because, uh, uh, you know, you train the Gaussian process regression on the quantum data, but it also contains uncertainty of every prediction because it's based on the Gaussian process. And so you can also map the prediction of the uncertainty in the same way that you essentially can quickly predict the variance of the forces and energies. And so now you can do an active learning kind of scenario. So you can start with collecting training data, building these force fields, running molecular dynamic simulations with them. And uh, then for every prediction, you can ask, is the uncertainty of my prediction high? And if it's high, then the model basically will not predict something that's unlikely to be correct, but actually will call DFT, will get another training point. And then it updates itself. 
updates the database, retrains, and then continues now with much more confidence. This active learning loop essentially is a way of autonomously generating your training set and building your force field on the fly. And so you can then, during the simulation, pick up on certain things that you haven't anticipated and that show up as high uncertainty uh, configurations and feed them back onto DFT, refine your force field. And then uh, in this example, it's a standing sheet where some local decomposition is starting to happen. And if you train the force field iteratively and perform this simulation, uh, you end up actually being able to describe how the standing sheet itself collapses, disorders, and then reorders in a 3D crystal. So this sort of 2D to 3D transformation uh, with a single force field that's trained in this on the fly fashion. You can also apply this to study phase transitions in more conventional settings, like you know, this is a pressure induced phase transition of silicon carbide where you squeeze a zinc blend structure and observe it turn into rock salt without having told the model anything about the rock salt structure. It discovers it as a new, unfamiliar configuration. When you see this uncertainty as a function of time, all of a sudden spikes above a threshold, indicating something new is happening. It calls DFT some number of times, gets the information, retrains the force field, and then proceeds to correctly describe the phase transformation between these two phases uh, by building the force field on the fly. And you can compare with experiment quite favorably, uh, making sure that uh, what it's predicting is actually correct. You can take it further and predict uh, the entire phase diagram in temperature pressure space for a material like silicon carbide where there are a lot of questions. And can you actually make an amorphous material by melt and quench process? It turns out that if you uh, try to do this in molecular dynamic simulation, again, these are large scale MD running with these flare potentials in lamps, then you see that there is no way to go from a liquid directly uh, to an amorphous solid or even a homogeneous uh, crystal without going through a region and phase space, which is this incongruent separation between solid carbon and liquid silicon. And this happens at all pressures uh, until you hit a very, very high pressure where you just don't even melt anymore at that particular temperature. So these are kind of simulations enabled by uh, on-the-fly learning with, uh, with flare. You can analyze such a very complicated phase diagram like this. So moving towards uh, catalysis a bit more uh, and looking at surfaces, just as our examples, very large scale patterns typically form on gold 111 surfaces, which are important for catalysis, but also for sort of surface science fundamental questions. This is what's seen in the experiment. And until the development of machine learning potentials, it hasn't been possible to simulate surface reconstruction directly because the accuracy uh, was not sufficient with the standard EEM potentials dealing with surface uh, relative uh, small energy differences on all these packing. And so with uh, flare potentials now, uh, you can directly sort of simulate. You start with a you know, gold 111. Don't tell the model anything what it should do, and it will spontaneously reconstruct, forming these sort of uh, zigzag kind of uh, patterns with the right length scale. And these are simulations that you need to run at very high accuracy and also at very large sizes, like hundreds of thousands of atoms. And you can run directly at room temperature, simulating what exactly happens in an experiment to find that reconstruction in some cases happens almost immediately as soon as you put some defects it nucleates these events and in some cases um you know it takes some uh, you know nano nanoseconds that the material uh, does not want to spontaneously nucleate this kind of reconstructed facet so you can study both the kinetics and the phase diagram of reconstructed surfaces using these kind of simulations and then of course uh, the more complicated scenario is bringing in reactive dynamics this is sort of where machine learning potentials actually shine is because there's very limited um, uh, potentials for reactive systems traditionally available. So now with these flexible functional forms that machine learning models uh, uh, can use, you can describe how, let's say, hydrogen molecule interacts with the catalytic surface of platinum slab, how dissociation happens, how diffusion on the surface and recombination and desorption so all these chemical processes that actually define catalysis, you can run in a smaller sort of supercell that is again running in this active learning loop every time sort of a red atom pops up here, you essentially indicate a rare event that is unfamiliar to the model. It's called DFT at that configuration and proceed. So it will learn on the fly to describe um, all the chemical processes that are required to capture catalytic uh, activation of hydrogen on platinum. And so the number of calls to DFT, you can see sort of 
typically is in a few hundred, and most of them are actually the ones that are complicated. In other words, interaction of hydrogen with platinum. Uh, it, it very quickly learns how to describe the platinum slab, the hydrogen gas, or uh, the platinum surface. Most of the attention the model ends up completely automatically. There's no human sort of intervention here. It uh, it learns uh, mostly on this this kind of, kind of scenario. And you can see sort of it starts off with lots of DFT calls, but then uh, eventually these black dots become sparse and sparse and sparser because the model sort of learns on the fly uh, how to deal with these reactive uh, configurations. So this is uh, something that uh, the model uh, learns in terms of you know predicting how forces determine dynamics of catalytic systems, but also it's important to verify that uncertainty that's inherently built into this Bayesian model um, is uh, accurate, in other words, reliable and useful for active learning and for distinguishing new from old configurations. And so these are the tests that basically indicate that, yes, uh, in the regime where the model is trained, its uncertainty actually is very robust in the sense that, you know, uh, in the Platinum 111, it tracks very well the actual true error of the calculation. That's not quite the case for uh, uh, situations where the model has not been trained on some other facets of platinum, where the error the, with respect to DFT is somewhat higher, but also the uncertainty is higher. And so you can sort of uh, assure the fact that um, the uncertainty grows as the error grows. So they track each other, and uh, the error actually lies within the predicted uncertainty of 99% confidence regions in this case. So this is very important to establish for a model like this, which is a Bayesian force field. And so then, uh, once you do this kind of uh, exercise, training, uh, mapping the model, which is important, now you can take it to larger scale. So this is important, because once the model is mapped, it becomes a very cheap to evaluate a force field, which you can introduce into lamps, and then lamps, does a fantastic job of scaling calculations across multiple computational units. So you can study, let's say, a thousand atoms. In this case, simulate directly a chemical reaction, like uh, essentially what happens in the reactor. You turn on the temperature, you observe hydrogen molecules interact with the platinum surface, and simply count how many reactive events have happened. And this is exactly what an experiment would do, measuring concentration of products. And then we change the temperature of the simulation, and then look at how uh, the activation energy comes out with respect to experiment, and we find very good agreement. And essentially, this is a what we uh, think of as a digital twin of a chemical reactor experiment running entirely on a computer and learning sort of autonomously from the from the beginning using DFT as a reference data. And you get something that you can now scale up and study all the reaction mechanisms by pulling out various configurations, looking at statistics of what happened, what's dominant, what's uh, what's the bottleneck step, and so forth. And you can also take it to extremely large scale. So this is why, uh, you know, uh, we put extra scale in the titles because you know this work by Anders Johansson uh, showed that you know you can use lamps to run essentially on the entire summit machine using twenty-seven some thousand GPUs to achieve what we uh, uh, what was at the time uh, the largest MD simulation uh, of about half a trillion atoms all running with this machine learning potential at essentially quantum accuracy and in principle uncertainty on every atom as well. So this is sort of a simulation of a sample you can almost see by naked eye. It's a couple of microns across. And um, this is something that now you can deploy um, at scale to study very complicated catalytic systems and do a lot of analysis afterwards. So this is the class of force fields called uh, you know, Bayesian force fields using flare. We can do very large, very fast simulations. We have uncertainty. We do have limitations of these methods. It's important to note that you know the the uh, current uh, public versions uh, don't deal very well with many chemical species. You can only deal with certain amounts of training set sizes, so basically training set points, because of the linear algebra that you need to perform during Gaussian process regression. So there are some limitations um, uh, like that, which are addressed with a different class of models. Uh, based on neural networks. And this is uh, a class of models called equivariant neural networks. We'll explain what that means. But there you get the advantages that it's state of the art accuracy and transferability. So essentially you get the most accurate models possible at this point uh, in time with these equivariant architectures. They can learn on very large amounts of data and they don't care about how many elements you have in terms of chemical complexity, but they tend to be slower than these um, 
kernel-based methods. But again, speed is something that is very tunable and it's a trade-off always between accuracy and speed. So it's hard to say uh, absolutely which one is faster, which one is more accurate. And by the way, I uh, would like uh, to point out that uh, Anders will give a talk later today on more specific details of limitation and scaling of these methods. So what are uh, graph neural networks or uh, ways of describing interatomic potentials with neural networks is essentially you have atoms that uh, you don't start with a descriptor like ACE, but you start with some sort of information being passed around between atoms, which is quite simple. In this case, you know, the information that's being passed around it could be just distances between atoms. So which distances this atom sees, it encodes this information and it passes it to the neighbor. The neighbor passes that information to its neighbor. And so you build up the sort of many body information in a way that um, can describe the environment. And this is the idea that was introduced in a model called Schnett, and then some models followed afterwards, based on these scalars, like distances, in other words, invariants. And then uh, uh, having the model, this graph neural network, essentially then eventually learn energies and forces. It's a big advantage compared to descriptor methods because you don't need to worry about representations even. Like these models learn their presentations. There are some limitations, as uh, uh, we realize that you know using only scalars and using only invariants is limiting. You can mathematically argue why it's limiting. So, in other words, you have a conventional neural network which operates on scalars, multiplying, you know, adding, uh, passing through nonlinear functions. So, all of that um, is very conveniently implemented in existing frameworks, but is limiting in terms of describing geometry. You're missing certain ways of con describing configurations. But if you encode directional information in higher order tensors, that becomes much more descriptive. And that's what we call equivariant models. In other words, the math that happens inside the model, this message passing is now operating on vectors, which encode directional information or tensors of higher rank. And so now you have a model where if you rotate the input, if you rotate the structure uh, of the molecule, all the features inside the network also rotate. And in terms of math, the way it's done is, is essentially with spherical harmonic uh, representations of the um, rotational group. And then you operate uh, on these larger objects, which include scalars and vectors and tensors of higher rank. And these messages, these equivariant messages that uh, have tensor information in them are being passed around between atoms. This is an architecture that we called MECWIP. It was the first sort of equivariant model that showed that actually you can get a lot of advantages in accuracy using these kind of uh, representations. And uh, uh, you have to uh, do some additional work um, to uh, to make sure that the neural network is uh, is able to encode information in a flexible way. So you have to operate on tensor products as sort of the basic source of your nonlinear operation in the network. And um, uh, you can find details in this in this paper here. On the practical side, what these models do is they learn much faster, in other words, with much fewer data and also to a much lower error. This is just an example compared to an earlier invariant model of a water system where the uh, model was trained on a thousand times less data, but also produced a smaller error. And that uh, sort of result is now about two years old or so. Um, this has been confirmed in many other systems that you know these equivariant um, neural network architectures uh, outperform uh, previous uh, models and are quite essential to achieving state-of-the-art accuracy. In addition to accuracy, what these models seem to be doing is also extrapolate better. So accuracy is only like a mean kind of uh, a measure of what on average is the error, but also if you run molecular dynamic simulations with machine learning force fields, a typical uh, thing you will see is that uh, simulations will start exploding your lamp simulation will report lost atoms or uh, the, the velocities will be so high it will fail. And that's because of the outliers. It's because of the large error predicted uh, forces that essentially uh, will uh, uh, make the integration unstable. And so these equivariant models have some sort of uh, advantage in also extrapolation outside their training domain. And this is illustrated by this work we did together with Gabor Jani last year uh, is, you know, you give it training data in this domain, but actually an equip, this red model here, approximates DFT quite well, very far in configuration space, in this case, measured by the dihedral angle. So uh, these, uh, 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 you know, advantages are not only in uh, accuracy near the training set, but also far away from it. And that gives you additional robustness in MD simulations 
known here, that only Nick Whip in this case was able to survive the entire uh, MD run for this uh, set of systems that were tested. And this is work done by Tommy Yakola's group, actually, at MIT. So uh, the challenge with graph neural network models is that they need to pass messages between atoms. And this is very difficult in lamps to uh, deal with in terms of parallelization if you have you know multiple messages being passed between atoms multiple times, multiple layers in the model, which is what's important for capturing many body information, you end up, uh, let's say, at six layers, which is a, a, you know, a typically accurate model. You need 20,000 neighbors, and then you have to deal with these 20,000 neighbors and pass them around. Uh, and this becomes very difficult to scale. So ideally, what you would have is a model that doesn't have such a large receptive field of atoms. So this was a um, uh, limitation that was removed by the development of the Allegro model by Albi Musaylan. The Allegro model takes the same sort of ideas of equivariant many-body information, but constructs it, uh, the, the, architecture, the architecture in such a way that the information never gets out of a local environment. So it's a strictly local equivariant model. That was the first sort of model that said, okay, we don't need message passing, essentially. We just make sure that the information between the atoms is collected by the central atom, but is not passed around to any other atom outside of this uh, region. And this is done by doing tensor products uh, of features that live on the edges between atoms, so these pairwise features, and the environment that the atom sees, as opposed to sort of passing this around. But you could also take an equip model and introduce sort of many body information, not just two body information that's on the edges and have like a message passing many body uh, information. I'll uh, mention this a bit later. But the point here in the Allegro's architecture is that you have this sort of two-track um, uh, setup where a lot of weights, a lot of complexity is actually done in the invariant part of the model, the scalar part. And the equivariant information is still there, but it's kept to a minimum because the computational cost is higher. And this architecture allows you to sort of tune how many weights you put in your model on the scalar versus the tensor parts. And so this allows you to minimize the cost while at the same time maximizing the accuracy in a flexible way. So in terms of performance, Allegro achieved state-of-the-art compared to previous models, uh, including you know, uh, some graph neural networks and transformers. And what you see in comparison with other models um, listed here, like you know, the ANI data set, the GAP, the ACE, all these sort of uh, uh, models on a, a molecular benchmark, uh, what you see is that the equivariant class of models, these Nequip, Mace, and Allegro, they really uh, are the state of the art in terms of uh, accuracy. And uh, that shows that equivariance is important. And uh, yeah, like I said, you could take Nequip and make it many body uh, in, 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 in um, um, passing messages, also increasing the accuracy by reducing the number of uh, layers you, sh you should be using. This is an idea we developed together with, again, Kaborjani's lab, uh, and this was implemented by their group uh, as MACE now. But um, uh, the point is that now you have a strictly local model like Allegro that doesn't do any of this message passing, and you can train it on something like a SPICE data set, which includes DFT calculations for small uh, peptide fragments in water, and you can essentially then say, okay, I trained on these fragments, then I can construct proteins and put them on water and simulate very large structures at the sort of essentially quantum chemical accuracy, but going to complex biomolecular systems with multiple elements and simulate these protein dynamics and confirm again that these simulations of running Allegro in lamps are stable over, you know, uh, nanoseconds so that you know you have a robust accurate model and then the question is how much can you scale it up and this is again the work that we did with LB uh, Masalan uh, Simon Batster and uh, Anders Johansson on scaling this to thousands of GPUs again relying on the parallelization capabilities uh, and the speed of lamps and essentially achieving uh, a biomolecular simulation of uh, an entire viral capsid of 44 million atoms, all in explicit water. Water is not shown here. Um, and this uh, is uh, detailed in this preprint if you're interested. 
and uh, happy to know that this was selected as a finalist in the uh, Gordon Bell Prize competition this year. On another practical application side, what you can do is you can actually combine uh, active learning flare architectures with accuracy of Allegro in studying complicated phenomena that happen at the interfaces between electrode and electrolyte uh, materials in solid state batteries. It's another sort of very complex um, uh, situation where experiments cannot figure out what's going on, but it's actually controlling the lifetime of these devices. So these are simulations that describe what chemical rearrangements happen at these interfaces. So um, as you can see, sort of there's this a uh, gap that's been closing by machine learning force fields between actually you know interesting engineering problems and catalysis and batteries and phase transformations and materials and the basic atomistic physics that drives it so machine learning forces are able to sort of take the accuracy of dft quantum mechanics and take it to a scale where you can do it uh, on large supercomputers and study uh, very very large uh, and complex uh, systems and answer some real important questions for technology and it was um, surprising, but in the retrospect, not so surprising that only in the past year, a number of companies actually adopted our tools like Allegro and LAMPS and uh, have been using it for developing materials uh, internally. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to highlight an interesting development. The CEO of Microsoft actually highlighted uh, both uh, LAMPS and Flare in an announcement of uh, Azure Quantum Elements which is a, a cloud offering that uh, essentially is uh, supporting the work of all these companies uh, uh, in the future for providing essentially all, all these uh, all this infrastructure on the cloud. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And of course, thank everybody who contributed to this work, the funding sources, the computational resources, and uh, would be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Boris. Um, we do have some questions in Slack. Um, so. The first is, is it correct to say that a mixture of, or is it correct to say that this is a mixture of both reinforcement learning and supervised learning? I'm not well versed in, in machine learning, but I'm confused about the nomenclature of active learning. So active learning, I guess, is related uh, uh, to uh, sometimes what's called online learning. So not really reinforcement learning. In reinforcement learning, you uh, uh, learn a... Uh, a reward function that affects sort of decisions you take. In our case, uh, we don't take any sort of uh, uh, decisions on how to change the configuration of what regions to go and explore. We rely entirely on molecular dynamics uh, or, or to, to sample what configurations we're gonna look at next. So uh, there, there, is, there is not sort of direct connection uh, yet with reinforcement learning. But uh, if you want to look at uh, machine learning liquid literature, online learning or active learning, other sort of the, the correct uh, uh, fields to look at, because what we do, essentially, we have a data acquisition function. So the only decision we take is, is this a new point? Should we go and compute it in an expensive way or just forget about it? So uh, that's, that's what is uh, sort of what Flare is doing in this active learning loop. Okay, thank you. The next question is, is the flare potential for uh, silicon carbide available online? Very quickly, it will be available. Uh, we are just finalizing the manuscript, and we're going to put out both the potential and uh, the, the data uh, online. So stay tuned in a few weeks, let's see. OK, uh, next question. Do you often start with a GAFF, G-A-F-F-like potential as a base? So we typically start with DFT as a training data. In some cases, when we want to understand a little bit the timeline uh, or the time scale of a problem or uh, you know how much data a model would need, sometimes for organics especially, we start with an off-the-shelf classical force field like OPLS just to see what kind of things to expect. But in all cases, the training starts really with DFT uh, data. Okay. Uh, next question, is there any limitation on the number of different chemical elements you can use with Nequip or Allegro? No, uh, that uh, is uh, inf that information is embedded in a feature of a constant size. So uh, the number of elements is, uh, it can basically deal with any number of elements. We haven't really pushed it uh, to the very limit of, let's say, using 100 elements, 
but some people have, and they report it's still working. Okay. Um, next question. Are, are results derived from machine learning accurate and applied to predict the mechanical properties of nanocrystalline material or nanocrystalline metals? This includes stress strain value predictions and the assessment of defects evolution within these materials. Uh, yes, uh, particularly with the flare model, because uh, especially if you're dealing with not too many different elements, let's say you, you're looking at a single element or maybe a binary alloy, uh, we have looked at elastic constants. We have uh, looked at, and we're looking right now at plastic deformation, looking at dislocation dynamics in uh, in materials uh, which are important for understanding mechanical response sort of beyond the elastic regime so yeah i mean uh, this has also been done before with em potentials so uh, and these workflows have been established how to look at you know screw dislocations things like that uh this is uh, only taking sort of these new models and replacing the underlying energy calculation with these new more accurate uh, uh models uh, another question, do you ever find that the new data point selected by your acquisition function leads to a machine learning intertopic potential that is worse than if that point was not included? Uh, so uh, there's there's a subtlety here. So it won't get worse. Uh, it might get distracted by irrelevant points if you add too many points in the regime that's irrelevant to the simulation which you can easily do by just not sampling correctly uh then the model at some point will not be able to accept more data just because of limitations of how big the training set can be so by including in in the flare architecture specifically by including a lot of uh data that's not too close to where you want to be in the simulation can result in a worse model than if you selected in a better way and then sometimes you need to play around with this. Sometimes you need to change the thresholds of the simulation so it doesn't get overwhelmed with irrelevant data. In some sense, the same is true for neural network models. Uh, you need to make sure that whatever label you actually mostly care about for predictions is the one that needs to be emphasized in the training set. Okay. And the last question we have time for is, is it possible to use flare to machine learn a potential for systems with electric charges or magnetic systems? As far as I understand, ACE is not able to do this yet. So this is still an open area of development. There are some models that are proposed. Uh, I know that uh, flare and well, in principle, you can do these simulations. You could put in a charge model uh, as an additional sort of analytic, explicit analytic term in the in the potential and learn, learn the residual with either flare or allegro and some groups have done this we haven't played with this yet but this is a very much an active area of research in the community how to deal with electric charges if it's a constant charge absolutely no problem even lamps can do it if it's a charge that changes as a function of the atomic environment you need to have a way to describe that and that's where the difficulty is it's not in the machine learning force field itself but i should say the Allegro and the Flare machine learning models are strictly local in the sense that they inherently cannot describe long-range uh, interactions like Coulomb. You need to, add, you know, additional include additional terms to describe them, but that's that's a difficult uh, sort of separate uh, problem to do it in a very general way. So not 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 just yet, I think, is the answer. All right. Well, thank you, Boris. That was an excellent talk. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Aidan Thompson from Sandia National Laboratories. He'll be speaking on what's new in LAMPS. Thanks, Dan, and uh, thanks, Boris, for an excellent uh, keynote talk. Uh, for the next 15 minutes, I'm going <clears> to <throat> give a whistle-stop tour of all the uh, improvements and additions that have been made to the LAMPS uh, code base in the last two years since the last uh, LAMPS workshop. Um, but before I do that, I should set my, my pointer up. I'll do that real quick. Okay, that's not so great. Let's try that again. Uh, is, is my audio and my slides uh, clearly visible? Yeah, and we can see your laser pointer too. All right, now I just need to figure out how to change slides, which I'm having a little bit of trouble doing. Uh, 
Okay, there we go. So uh, before I get into the the, uh, the code itself, I wanted to talk about the code development team. Um, that has changed uh, and grown in size uh, over the last two years, but um, it's also changed in a different way. Steve Plimpton, who is the originator of LAMPS and the, and the longtime lead developer, has uh, retired from Sandia, but he is still very actively involved in LAMPS. And just to make sure that continues, we gave him a nice uh, glass memento with the LAMPS logo and the, uh, the caption, Steve Plimpton, benevolent dictator for life. Uh, on, a, on a daily basis, the not so benevolent dictator is Axel Kohlmeyer, who does a huge amount of work uh, maintaining the LAMPS code base, improving it, uh, reviewing pull requests, uh, fixing up pull requests in some cases, and um, also uh, responding to many, many questions on the, on the LAMPS user forum. Stan Moore does a lot of work on um, high performance computing, particularly the Cocos package uh, that enables LAMPS to run efficiently on GPUs. He also um, works on the case based package and, and the React CFF package in LAMPS. Uh, myself, Aidan Thompson, I do a lot of work in um, inner atomic potentials, implementing new ones in LAMPS, uh, particularly machine learning potentials. And I collaborate with a lot of people at Sandia and elsewhere, applying these uh, things to uh, various material science applications. Trung Nguyen at University of Chicago, uh, by the way, the, the top row are kind of people who have been longstanding members of the LAMPS development team. The bottom row are, are the new growth. Um, and so Trung is, is one of those. Uh, he is an expert in applying LAMPS to uh, soft matter, condensed matter physics, and also uh, is very active in uh, the GPU package in LAMPS and has also been involved in, in the Amoeba package, actually. Uh, Joel Klemmer at Sandia, I have a slide on his work later, uh, does a lot of really exciting work in, in granular materials, uh, extending the, the LAMPS functionality in all kinds of different ways to, to provide better descriptions of, of granular materials, particularly in the granular package, but now also the bond, the, the bonded particle methods package. Richard Berger, uh, who actually worked with uh, uh, Axel at Temple for quite a bit, is now at Los Alamos and in a sense has rejoined the team in a somewhat different capacity. Uh, he is the longstanding expert on the Python interface, the various versions of the Python interface that LAMPS provides and is also now getting involved in high performance computing. Drew Rosekopf at Sandia uh, is doing a lot of work in machine learning interatomic potentials, including SNAP and ACE, but also the MLIAP package that I'll try to talk about in a couple of minutes. Um, there are, of course, hundreds of other contributors that focus on particular parts of LAMPS, and there are thousands of power users that are constantly pushing us to provide more functionality and, and better performance on, on new architectures. So um, a big development uh, since the last workshop was the 2022 LAMPS review paper. This is the first paper that was on the entirety of LAMPS since uh, Steve's original 1995 paper. Um, it's got a long list of authors that are shown here. It's, it's in uh, computer physics communications. It is definitely worth checking out. It's, it's about 60 pages long, so you, you should not expect to read the whole thing, but, but it, it is um, a, a mine of information on many different aspects of LAMPS, including an overview of the code structure and algorithms that LAMPS, that makes LAMPS so powerful and so flexible. Um, it describes a lot of different uh, models and features that are available in LAMPS in a, in a succinct way, um, and also provides a lot of information on the various acceleration packages in LAMPS that allow uh, it to run well on different architectures. On the right is a, a nice um, a cover art that we were asked to provide to the, the, the journal issue, um, and it highlights the range of different uh, scales that LAMPS can operate on. So the particles that LAMPS represents can be atoms, including uh, atomic spins that are shown by these little arrows. And more typically, the particles are, are just atoms. Um, and this, this snapshot shows a, a multi-billion atom simulation of a shockwave moving through a diamond. Uh, but the particles can also be slightly larger chunks of atoms like molecules or functional groups, and that's 
usually referred to as coarse graining. In this case, uh, this is an image of um, a, coarse, a coarse grain model of uh, biological, two biological vesicles fusing. And so this allows you to get to length scales and time scales that will be hard to get to uh, directly with, with all atom simulations. But then the, the tour de force is a recent work uh, done by collaboration between Sandia and Los Alamos uh, in the form of the Dempsey code that is built on top of the granular package in LAMPS that uh, models the entire uh, Arctic region. It models the sea ice in the Arctic region where each sea ice particle is a couple of kilometers in, in diameter. And this shows the, uh, the change in the sea ice distribution going from winter time to summertime in the Arctic region. <clears throat> okay, so now let me give you the, the whistle stop tour of new features. Um, first of all, symbolic types were added by uh, Jay, Jay Kissinger for a variety of different uh, styles in, in lamps. You can now replace the numbers that are typically used with actual uh, alphanumeric strings that are easier to for humans to remember. Uh, fixed shake and fixed rattle support has been added to minimization in lamps. Uh, YAML output has been uh, provided for output. Both of these were done by Axel. And Steve Plimpton has uh, done a lot of work on adding a new uh, general grid functionality in lamps that can be used for things like the two temperature model, but can also be used for uh, fixes and pairs and case based styles in lamps, kind of treating all of these things in, uni in a unified manner. He's going to give a 15 minute talk on this and how, maybe how it might be used for other things um, on Friday morning. Uh, so, New commands, the ACKS2 or AX2 uh, ReactsFF uh, version of charge recalibration has been added by Meta and Actolga. I think Stan was also involved in that. Interlayer potentials have been added by Wenjen Uyang. Uh, the Bohr matrix uh, calculation was added by myself and Germain Clavier. And this is a, a really nice way now. And there's some great examples that have been added to the, uh, the, the example section of LAMPS showing how. You, you can get the full elastic stress tensor for, for any crystal with, with arbitrary symmetry for any interatomic potential uh, at any temperature and pressure of interest. And this is something that in the past was very challenging to do and it was labor intensive. Basically you had to do uh, different deformations in different directions and do a lot of uh, careful sampling. And now uh, with this Bohr matrix method, the whole thing is a lot more straightforward and it really boils down to sampling the stress stress fluctuations, which is a separate calculation uh, that is now the bottleneck. So in other words, the Bohr matrix is, is no longer the bottleneck. Um, we added uh, uh, fixed SGCCMC directly to the, to the Monte Carlo package and lamps. This used to be a, a third party software that's widely used in material science. Um, and this was done by Axel and myself. We're hoping that this can be uh, used in the future to uh, provide support for more interatomic potentials. Um, we, we have a prototype now that, that makes it work for the snap potential, but we think it could be used for, for example, any of the potentials that Boris just talked about as well. Um, <clears throat> the uh, mean pair potential lamps has been extended to uh, mean MS. This is important for, for, for certain materials models. I was done by Drew Rosekopf and myself and Mike Baskus. Uh, the fire mod, uh, minimizer in lamps has been extended to ABC fire by Sebastian Restrepo. Uh, Tom Swinburne of CNRS uh, added the eco mode to the NEB uh, calculation in lamps. This allows you to balance the left and right branches of the minimum energy pathway so that your, your, your string doesn't get too lopsided in a sense. Uh, fix alchemy and uh, compute pressure alchemy commands for multipartition alchemical transformations were added by Axel. Uh, two, uh, two lamps. Um, new packages, so entirely new packages that were added. Uh, there was a major update to the Lattice Boltzmann package by Colin uh, Denniston and, and co workers. Uh, the bonded particle method was added by Joel Clemmer. I'll talk about that in a second. The electrode package was added by Sharon T and co workers. This is a, a way to look at uh, the effect of electric fields on, on complex fluids and, and solid phases, uh, particularly for uh, battery applications. The MDI package, this was another large effort that uh, Steve Plimpton uh, worked on um, both right before and right after his retirement. <clears throat> um, and it provides now code coupling for codes like, for ab initio codes like LATTE, NWPEN, 
and pi SCF. Uh, and uh, I think somewhere here it says, uh, this is yeah, in collaboration with Taylor Barnes at, at MOL SSI, MOLC. Uh, the amoeba package has been added that provides support for polarizable force fields like amoeba and hippo. And that was done by Josh Racker, Steve Clinton and Chong Mian. So uh, new packages continued. Uh, there's a lot of work done on the MLIAP package that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, first of all, the Python interface was, was um, added by uh, Stephen and Aya and Nick Lovers. This was also cocosized uh, by uh, Matt Bettencourt at NVIDIA. And finally, uh, Drew Roscoff, has, who has been working using uh, a lot of these features in the MLIP package, he has now added support for JAX that I'll talk about in, in a second. Uh, the ML Pace package, uh, it seems like more than two years since that was added because it's it's been uh, long awaited. Uh, but but it, it was added in the last two years and has actually been upgraded multiple times and now supports active learning uh, functionality similar to, to what Boris just talked about um, <clears throat> for ACE models. The ML pod package was added by uh, Drew Roskopf and co-workers at uh, MIT and the lepton package for uh, evaluation of string expressions was added by Axel. And now I just want to take a couple of, see I'm out of time. Uh, I oh. got two minutes left, is that correct? Yeah, about three minutes. Three minutes, great. So I really want to show the, the bonded particle method. Uh, and I must admit, I don't fully understand it, but it's got some really amazing movies. So I'm just going to play those movies while I talk. Uh, and essentially, it's a way to build very realistic um, mesoscale or macro scale representations of particulate solids. And these, these can be discrete packings, like the first movie. They can be um, sort of more... Um, cohesive solids with, with pores in them, like the second movie. And then finally, the third movie, I, I'm not 100% sure what it is. You'll have to go to Joel's talk at the breakout session on Friday to find out what this is. But, but essentially, from a code point of view, it, it combines uh, small particles with simple interactions like um, tangential forces and torques with, uh, with springs that can be, say, harmonic springs that, that bind these particles together in particular formations like the, uh, the flexible cylinders that are shown in, in the first movie. And uh, this is very useful for a wide variety of, of applications at the mesoscale and macro scale that uh, cannot be done in any other way. Um, I'll now just mention briefly this, this JAX uh, method in, in the MLIP package. Uh, the real power of this is that is shown on the right, where um, if you want to add a new model uh, to two lamps uh, for some new uh, machine learning in, in atomic potential, particularly uh, one that that uses uh, Jack's neural network as as the underlying energy model, um, you don't have to write the force calculation yourself. You don't have to write the gradient calculation. Instead, you just write. Uh, what we call the the um, the energy calculation, uh, which is, for example, in the case of Leonard Jones, shown by this very small amount of code on the right, and uh, the the forces corresponding to that energy calculation are uh, calculated automatically using auto diff by the JAX code package. So Drew has provided some nice examples of this in lamps, just sort of their toy models, but uh, this is. Has, has the potential to be widely used for uh, many different types of JAX models that people might be interested in. And it all works through the MLIP unified uh, wrapper and maps. And um, with that, I'm just gonna close with one more slide, which is interesting. Uh, it shows, first of all, based on uh, a, a statistical analysis of um, uh, papers that cite lamps, we can look at a snapshot from 2022 of which potentials are most heavily used in lamps. And the red circles, one, two, three, four, EAM, REACTS, FF, TERSOF, OPLS, and REBO show the five most uh, popular potentials. They're all empirical potentials. Um, and this is on a log logarithmic scale. So collectively, these represent more than 50% of papers uh, that cite lamps. But um, more and more popular are the uh, purple uh, ellipses, uh, deep pot, uh, beta parallel or neural network potentials, gap, moment tensor potentials, and of course, our own SNAP model um, that are all machine learning potentials. Uh, these are still not heavily used, but they're, they're very uh, 
new, and whereas these other models have been around for at least 20 years. And so the question in my mind was, well, how is this stuff changing over time? And so instead of just looking at 5,000 papers, I looked at all uh, 30,000 papers since 1994 that have cited lamps. And the time variation is now shown on this slide. And I've only shown the, uh, the top four potentials that I showed on the previous slide that are all empirical, EAM, Reacts FF, uh, Tursov, and Rebo, uh, which have all kind of plateaued after a, a rapid rise from, from the early days. And then collectively, all the machine learning potentials that I mentioned on the previous slide are represented by this green data set. And uh, just in the last couple of years, those uh, green points have passed out EAM. Um, not shown, of course, are a lot of the, the uh, even newer potential, even newer machine learning potentials than these, for example, ACE and NEQIP and so on. Um, these don't yet show up on this on this analysis because they, they haven't been around long enough to become popular. But my prediction is that this green uh, plot of the um, all machine learning potentials collectively is going to continue to grow in importance at LAMPS and may eventually become a more the, the majority of, of uh, use cases for LAMPS. With that, I'll stop and take any questions if I have any time. All right. Thank you, Aiden. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have much time for questions, uh, but you can uh, you know continue the discussions on Slack. Um, our next speaker is Imber Sikorsky from Sandia National Labs. And she's going to be talking about developing machine learning potentials for high temperature applications. Thank you, Stan. Uh, can you hear me and see my slides? Yes, we can see the side panel. Oh, there, there you go. That's good. Okay, you see the correct view? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, yeah. So I've been working on developing machine learning potentials for about the past two years now. So I'll be going over our lessons learned. So before I ask you to take my word on some of these maybe more controversial strategies for potential development, I'd like to show that these strategies work. So here are some results from the tungsten zirconium carbide SNAP potential that we published earlier this year. So we have these bicrystals that we are able to do tensile tests on. So these have one side, which is tungsten, and another side, which is zirconium carbide. And then on the bottom, we have the ultimate tensile strength we got out of these tensile tests versus temperature. So what was really reassuring is we were able to reproduce the first principles prediction for which interface was the strongest. And then we were able to take this a bit further than you can really do easily in DFT and look at how this strength changes at high temperatures. And what was interesting is this interface actually becomes the weakest at 2,500 Kelvin. We were able to look at what was causing this if we zoom in on the atomic profiles at the interface. So here's the atoms. And then on the right, we have the profiles in counts. And so at high temperature, all of the carbon from the zirconium carbide at the terminating layer diffuses into the tungsten and that results in a much weaker interface. So the workflow that we use to make these machine learning potentials is we start with a density functional theory training set and we feed that to our in-house code FitSnap. FitSnap is publicly available on GitHub and we're working on fleshing out the docs. So FitSnap is going to see this DFT training data and it's going to fit a potential. And so that's basically mapping local atomic environments to the corresponding energy and forces. Once FitSnap makes a potential, it can tell us the energy and force errors, which is the difference between what the potential thinks the energy and forces are for an atomic environment and what the DFT calculated. Another thing that we check with our potentials is how they perform on material property objective functions, which I'll talk a bit more about on the coming slides. Another piece that we need to optimize our potential is figuring out what hyperparameters to use. So we optimize these by interfacing with Dakota. So for instance, you can use a genetic algorithm. So Dakota is going to learn these energy force errors and material property errors from this loop, and it's going to use that information to figure out the best hyperparameters. And the ultimate goal here is you end up with a production potential that you can run large simulations on if you put it up on a large computing cluster. So here's an example of a 
material, or this one's more of a stability objective function. So here we're starting with a rock, site, rock salt structure with some interstitials. If you run it through ab initio molecular dynamics after several hundred second, femtoseconds, you get something like this. And then all of our candidate potentials, so ones that come out of Dakota, but are not necessarily the one we want to use for our production simulations, all of our candidate potentials we run through objective functions. So on the bottom left here, you can see the performance of one candidate potential on this identical simulation instead in LAMPS rather than in DFT. And we can see it's relatively similar to our AMD, AIMD truth value. So this one returns a relatively low objective function value. On the other hand, the candidate on the bottom right here exhibits a behavior we colloquially refer to as black holing, where you get many atoms that try to exist at almost the same point in space. So this is not the physical behavior we want to see. So it's set up to throw an arbitrarily large value back to Dakota so that Dakota knows pick candidates with hyperparameters that look like this one and not hyperparameters that look like this one. So anything you can make a LAMP simulation for, you can essentially turn into an objective function. So we have a few other stability objective functions that went into making the tungsten zirconium carbide potential. We also have several material property objective functions. So these are things like surface energies, bulk modulus, and thermal expansion. So you have them, you have the potential calculated in LAMPs, you subtract out the truth value we use from DFT, and then that's the error that Dakota tries to minimize. Now I wanna transition a bit to the training data that goes into these machine learned potentials. So if you can't run infinite DFT, and if you could, you might not need a machine learned potential, then where should you focus your DFT simulation ex efforts? So there's two sort of camps here. One of them we'll call domain expertise. This is where if you have someone familiar with DFT and you ask them what types of structures they think a potential should learn on, what structures would that person make? And then the other camp, which here is called entropy maximized, basically refers to convincing a computer to generate a bunch of structures for you. So an interesting finding from my colleague, David Montez et al, was that if you look at the validation error for using either one of these strategies or both of them combined, you can actually get lower errors when you combine both types of training sets than if you were to use only domain expertise or only entropy maximized. So in the tungsten zirconium carbide training set, we have both of those strategies. We have at the top of the schematic, the domain expertise. So your standard bulk surfaces, interfaces, you can have things like defects, the bulk modulus or equation of state structures. And then moving to the bottom, we have what I call beyond domain expertise structures. And the ones I'll highlight for now are these USPEX structures. So USPEX is a genetic algorithm structure predictor, and it can really help you get some very interesting structures into your training set. So we can sort of argue all day about what the best structures are to include, but it's really helpful to see how these training configurations look to our machine learned potential. So these are T-SNEs of the descriptors that the potential uses. So a T-SNE allows us to take high dimensional data and collapse it into two dimensions so that we humans can visualize it. And what we're looking for in these plots is coverage because as many of you may know, a, any sort of machine learning method tends to make near perfect predictions on structures it's seen before. And often it can make really terrible predictions on data that it's really never seen before. So the panels I wanna highlight, I'll start with panel C. So this is the ground state training data. And while ground state data can be very accurate, it really doesn't cover much of descriptor space that a potential needs to see. So moving to ab initio molecular dynamics structures in both panels D and E, adding temperature alone really starts to flesh out this descriptor space. And then in panel F, we can see that these USPEC structures are able to cover a region of descriptor space that's not captured by any other type of training data. 
So now here's a comment on improving the stability of a machine learned potential. So here we can see the volume versus energy curve for zirconium carbide. We have these red circles indicating DFT training points. And then in black, we have a candidate snap potential. So you can see that for all of the DFT, the snap potential produces it really well. Now, if you have very short interatomic distances where you don't have DFT training data, the potential can do whatever it likes, which in this case is plummeting to maybe negative infinity energy. So if you try to run this, especially at high temperature, as soon as you overcome this repulsive wall, your structure can drop into this black hole. So the way you can mitigate this is by turning on an inner cutoff where you say, okay, below these distances, I don't have any training data. So I'll completely turn the machine learning potential off. Instead, I'll replace it with a repulsive potential like ZBL. And then I will comment that this candidate snap potential said it had extremely low energy errors because it has good agreement everywhere it saw data. But that doesn't mean that the potential is not going to black hole. I'd like to belabor this point just a little bit more, and I'll do it in the context of a great question we received from one of our reviewers, which was, what do these different types of training data do for the performance of the potential? So I looked at the performance of the production potential, and then I made what I call these dropout potentials, where I removed an entire group of training data from the potential fit and made a new potential. So if we use energy and force errors as our metric for the quality of a potential and we're looking for lower errors, these results make it look like if you completely removed all of your ground state training data, you would get lower energy and force errors. Now, I took this a step further and I ran all of these dropped out potentials through the objective functions. And in this graph, we have the removed training group. And then if there's a bar here, it means that this dropped out potential performed worse on the objective function than the production potential did. So essentially what we can see from this graph is removing any type of training data from this production potential essentially destroys the performance, either in predicting the material properties or in the stability. So I will just caution that low force and energy errors may be promising, but they don't tell you much about the accuracy of your material properties or your dynamics. So I'll also encourage anyone developing machine learning potentials to immediately start taking their candidate potentials and run them on a small version of what you want to do your production simulations on. So this can be really insightful. For instance, on these potentials, we want to see stable zirconium carbide dispersoids inside of tungsten. We don't want to see zirconium carbide melt. So while this potential can throw low errors and low objective function errors, it's not exhibiting the physics that we want to see. So the sooner you get this into your loop, the sooner you can start making better decisions about your training data and optimization process. And so I don't have much time to talk about ACE, but if you're interested, my colleague James Goff, who implemented ACE and FitSnap is speaking later today. But so this is a rather aggressive objective function I have for adding hydrogen to this potential. And I don't really want it to get a graphite surface correct with hydrogen thrown at it, but I want it to do something somewhat physical. So here we have the AIMD. You can see if you use SNAP, you get these really weird C3H molecules, which are unphysical. But if you use ACE, you can start to maintain some graphene layers. And I'll just point out that this RDF peak at low distances is not the ACE potential's fault. I haven't finished optimizing the inner cutoff. Three so, minutes. Great. OK, so I'll leave up my recommendations for machine learning potential development. And I thank you for your time. And I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you, Ember. Um, so I had a question. So for the T SNE, can you could you work backwards so you could can you can you map that? So if you just wanted to like uniformly sample the T SNE, could you translate that back into like a real uh, configuration? I don't think we have the capabilities to turn a plot in the t a point in the TSNE map back into a structure. 
but I do believe we have the beginning of an active learning set where if you just gave it a bunch of structures, not necessarily run through DFT yet, you could use the T-SNE to pick structures from different points on the map and use that to decide what structures to run through DFT. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? So I don't I don't see any any in Slack. So uh, thank you, Ember. We appreciate your talk. That was great. Thank you. And our next talk is Eduardo Bringa from the University of Mendoza, and he'll be talking about simulations of high entry alloys, thermodynamics mechanical properties and radiation damage. Thank you, Stan, and thanks for the opportunity to, to show you our, our work. Basically, I want to emphasize that this is part of a, a large collaboration with a number of people inside my group, but also outside from, from Chile, Germany, the US, and sorry, just a second. And first of all, just for just in case someone hasn't heard of high entropy alloys, these are alloys with, with many components. So the entropy is maximized because of this mixing of components. And there are alloys with many different structures. You have also metallic alloys, ceramic alloys but we were focusing on, on metallic alloys right now. And um, Eduardo, can you go yes. full screen? Yes, sorry, I'm trying to do that right now. Sorry, one second. Sorry, let me, let me proceed and I'll, I'll try to go full screen in, in the meantime. So basically, we have been working on a number of mechanical properties and radiation damage properties. And the, the thing I want to emphasize is that, for instance, regarding radiation damage, experiments show that high entropy alloys are radiation resistant, okay? However, when we run the simulations, we did find that when we compare high entropy alloys to the, an average atom model, which is just taking out all the chemical complexity, we obtain pretty much the same result. So a lot of the results in the literature saying that high entropy alloys are radiation resistant during the primary damage stage is because they compare the high entropy alloy with nickel, with the pure metal. And in that case, it's like comparing apples and oranges. And it's not necessarily because of the chemical complexity that you, you observe this. So in addition to that, we have carried out the studies, you see, not only for bulk systems that are single crystals, but also for polycrystals and, um, and also for, for nanophones. So the, the key issue with the, with the high entropy alloys is, do we have a good potential? And we just heard about machine learning potentials. And of course, there is a push towards machine learning potentials. You see that some of the, uh, the results I will show you are for relatively large system with many millions atoms. So we will really need a really huge computational power in order to handle that. So we, we will focus on simpler potentials mostly embedded atom potentials. And one challenge that we have with the high entropy alloys is that the structure is distorted because of all these different elements. So if you just run your common neighbor analysis or even PTM that works a lot better than common neighbor analysis for most cases, you see that you get a lot of noise. So many people, for instance, have reported, oh, we have a, a phase change, you know, a phase increase. 
And we believe that in a lot of the, those cases, this is just noise, okay? And we are using machine learning in this case, not for the potential, but to identify the structure. And in particular, we have a machine learning method that will be discussed in an upcoming lightning talk very soon, showing that you can clean up that noise and really identify better those structures. So I want to focus on one particular aspect that is becoming hot in the high entropy alloy community, which is the chemical short range order. And there is a very nice review by Ferrari et al. that came out recently. And please take a look at this figure, which says that this order parameter that characterizes the order decreases with temperature. Okay. And usually this parameter is measured with the Warren Cowley parameter. And anyone interested, I, I can describe exactly what it is during the questions. So experimentally, there are evidences that this is real, okay? So, and this is based from diffuse scattering, streaking, and also from some EDS maps. You do have short range order in many high entropy alloys for many different experimental conditions. Now, what happens when you want to do this in virtual samples? Well, for virtual samples, most people do Monte Carlo. You start with a random sample, and then you swap atoms around based you know, on some energy barriers just with the metropolis scheme. You can do this within lamps. You can do this with other software, like Frey and Bayerlin presented the Monte Carlo code to do this at different temperatures. Basically, if you put the metropolis temperature term. But there are not really any accepted standards. And many people use a combination of these Monte Carlo swaps, molecular dynamics, runs, and minimization cycles. And of course, here there are many variables. So how many swaps per step? How many MD steps? Do you run the MD at constant volume or constant pressure? So the community is still exploring this significantly. Uh, one thing that most people more or less try to do is that basically if you have a sample, you try to swap atoms at least once you know, along, along the run to get a, a final equilibrated state that you see that this order parameter eventually converges after so many swaps. But how do you understand this? What's going on? And there is a still no really a full physical understanding on what are the effects for this. I just want to, to mention that this is like an ongoing effort to try to understand was behind this ordering in a high entropy alloy. And in some entropy alloys, this is not that, that large of an effect, okay? So you can see here values of this Warren Cowley parameter alpha that are fairly small. Here you have like a matrix of the Warren Cowley. And here I wanted to show that these chemical affinities proposed in the previous slide by some research group, they don't really have much relationship with the Warren Cowley parameter, okay? So again, for certain alloys, this is not so crucial, but if you take the same alloy and you put defects, then like this is put in a surface by simulating a nanofoam, then what you can see is that the Warren Cowley parameter does increase, it doesn't increase that much, but here we are employing a visualization trick to show you that actually there is some surface segregation. And there is actually a published paper that shows also that for this alloy, when you put grain boundaries, there is also segregation to the grain boundaries. But this is tricky because in order to do this, you really need to run this Monte Carlo and these MD runs for very large samples. This is like one and a half million atoms. And that again is very, very costly. In addition to that, if you take the same alloy, okay, but you add aluminum, it's well known for an experiment that you can go from FCC to BCC phases. And here we simulate a B2 precipitate. So this is a BCC type crystalline structure within an FCC matrix. And you can see in the matrix that you start with some unknown crystal structure atoms in white, okay? You can see that the type you have 50% aluminum inside, only very few aluminum atoms in red. 
in the outside. Now, when you let it evolve, if you evolve this just with Monte Carlo, no MD, no minimization, what happens is that the precipitate, the precipitate becomes a little bit smaller, but not much happens. But if you add MD, then you have a dramatic change. If you do MD, there is a strong segregation inside the precipitate. You prefer aluminum iron inside the precipitate with a little bit of cobalt. And then outside the precipitate, you have things like, like nickel and that has segregated significantly. So depending if you use Monte Carlo or Monte Carlo plus MD, you get totally different configurations. Now, what happens if you, if you try to analyze what happens in a refractory high entropy alloy, in a BCC high entropy alloy, is that things can become a little bit different. And in particular, what you have is that the, this alloy, the half neon, neon, tantalium, zirconium, in experiment, it has been shown that it shows some tantalum patterning in the walls of these cubes. And this was reproduced by Misra et al. using Monte Carlo and MD. So this is 2100 Kelvin. So according to the figure I showed you early on, there shouldn't be any segregation. There shouldn't be any short range order. What happens when you take another refractory alloy? Then you also get some short range order. So the short range order does not necessarily decrease at high temperatures. In particular, what you can see here is that actually for this alloy, if you use only Monte Carlo, you do see the decrease. If you use MD plus MC, you see an, an increase on the short range order. And actually you see some tantalum segregation the tantalum segregation is not exactly like the one you see in the experiments, but we, we think we are in the, in the right path. So let me conclude by saying that the short range order can affect many properties, including mechanical, irradiation, and magnetic properties. Again, the short range order in high entropy alloys might increase at high temperatures, okay? And it's not clear to us yet why is this. Is there some particular diffusivity issue, some anomaly related to slag diffusion, some other effect? Okay. I have to be careful about short range order and phase transitions. And again, if I do short range order in a fixed lattice with the Monte Carlo code alone, of course, I will not be able to see any phase transition if I only have jumps, you know, to fixed lattice sites. So we are looking also a lot at how short range order modifies plasticity how it modifies the free energy. But still, we feel that we need a strategy to obtain a stable short range order parameter for different alloys and different temperatures. And it's not clear to us yet what's the best way to do this, especially because it should depend on what type of experiments you are trying to emulate. I mean, in some experiments, you may not have short range order. And in some others, using a different synthesis, you may have that. So I'll, I'll leave it here with my conclusions and thank you very much. Thank you, Eduardo. Um, so we have, uh, let's see, Steve has a question. So Steve said, Steve Plimpton says, do you think machine learning potentials for a high entry alloy, alloy would give qualitatively different results than an EAM model? We have tried a, a, a couple of machine learning potentials for high entropy alloys. And for now, for the ones that we have tried, we do not see any qualitative differences, Steve. But of course, this, this may change. I mean, this is a very evolving field. And we look forward to use machine learning potentials for high entropy alloys. But if they are only a slightly more costly than embedded atom, not a hundred or a thousand times more costly. Okay, and Mitch Wood asks, Monte Carlo moves are made to fix lattice sites, question mark. Is it possible to allow for lattice relaxations to give the change in energy in Monte Carlo? Okay, that's that's an excellent point. Again, there are certain codes, like the one by from the group by Irene Beyerin, that they just take fixed lattice sites. But LAMPS is great. 
LAMPS allows you to do the jumps in whatever configuration you have. So we, we do take that into account. The, the only point that is, is tricky is that what do you do after you do a few Monte Carlo swaps to your, to your configurations that are not in a fixed lattice, but then do you allow the atoms to move a little bit and relax farther before you do more swaps? So that's one of the variables that you have there. I mean, do you allow the box, for instance, to expand and accommodate any extra pressure that you may have built with the swaps? Okay. Okay. Thank you. And we have time for one more question. Do you believe, or is it a known factor that the radiation damage is proportional to a low porosity or complex pore channels that you would see in high entropy alloys? Have you tried un have you, have you tried using packing methods in order to study the packing entropy? I am not sure I understand the question. I guess it may be related to building the high entropy alloy by different packing methods and that that may affect the radiation damage response. And the only thing that occurs to me is that certainly we expect the radiation damage to depend on the short range order, for instance, and whatever packing method you use to build your high entropy alloy. And luckily, experimentalists have found many different ways to build these high entropy alloys and obtain many different results, including some metastable uh, phase combination. For instance, even this, this FCC alloy I described early on they have lamellar phases, they have phases with precipitates, and they have different FCC phases like L12 and L10. So we have our hands full and will be entertained, I think, for many years to come. All right. Well, thank you, Eduardo. There's a few more questions in Slack, so be sure to check those out. Uh, but thank we need to move much. on. Yeah, so thank I'll you. Just stop sharing. All right, our next speaker is Drew Roscoff from Sandia National Laboratories. He'll be speaking on atomistic machine learning with LAMPS Fit Snap ecosystem. Thanks, Dan. Let me share my screen. Um, okay. Is this working? Yep, looks good. Great. So, hey everyone, I'm Drew Raskoff. I work at Sandia National Labs with Mitch Wood, Aiden Thompson, and many others who are talking today. And uh, we help develop LAMPS. We also develop FitSnap, which is our machine learning interface to LAMPS. And I'm gonna show some results on this LAMPS FitSnap ecosystem for um, training machine learning potentials. Um, specifically, this is going to be a study on exploring the effect of model complexity and ML potentials for property predictions and MD simulations. So let's get started. Uh, first of all, why do we want to do this? Um, we want to bridge this gap between the accurate but costly quantum methods and the cheaper, more scalable classical MD methods. And so we know with quantum methods, you're kind of stuck in this nanometer to maybe nanosecond regime. Uh, but with classical MD, you can really get up into the micron to microsecond regime. And that's really where you want to be if you want to predict material properties for a wide variety of awesome applications. And so we're thinking of classical MD as this fast, but hopefully accurate predictive capability as an engineering tool. So that's just a motivating example, but how exactly do we bridge this gap and make the potential? So we do this in a modular way by splitting the potential into descriptor and model components. And this is actually a pretty common way of thinking. So on the descriptor side, we have these performant implementations in LAMPs, uh, such as SNAP, ACE, and others. And what these implementations do is they take in interatomic displacement data and transform it into these translationally and rotationally invariant descriptors or features for the machine learning model. And then FitSnap uh, takes these features and injects it, injects them into a uh, machine learning framework like PyTorch or JAX. 
And then the output of these models are the per atom ener uh, potential energies, EI, for each atom I. So I'm going to walk through how we build the computational graph to train these models to DFT energies and forces. So first, we've got to sum over all atoms in the system to get the total potential energy E of a structure. And then we got to take the gradient of that energy to get uh, the force Fj on each atom, each atom J. This is the spatial gradient. So for the force, we do the same separation that we did for the energies. Uh, where again, in LAMPS, we have these performant implementations of the descriptor derivatives that are pre-calculated, pre-computed for this calculation. And then in FitSnap, uh, we calculate the model derivative of the output with respect to the input using Autograd. So once we have these energies and forces, uh, we just plug it into a loss function to minimize. So this is a weighted mean squared error uh, for the energies and the forces with respect to DFT. Um, we just use Autograd to uh, minimize this loss with respect to the model parameters theta in this equation. So you can find more details um, looks like the share screen is blocking some of the slides. So you, you can find more details on this procedure um, in our recently published JOS paper. And also we have a lot of documentation and a tutorial on our FitSnap GitHub IO page. But now that we have this framework, this opens up the doors to a lot of studies that can be done on uh, model complexity, different uh, model descriptor combinations that are appropriate, which ones are more appropriate for a wide variety of uh, different applications. And I'm going to show one such example study here. So our hypothesis is that more complex models, irrespective of the descriptors, should give you more accurate fits, which should give us more accurate simulated properties with respect to DFT. Now, before I dive into that, I'm going to go over uh, the case studies that we're going to do and uh, also some of the models and data sets that we'll explore. So we have three uh, primary models in FitSnap. Uh, the first and simplest are the linear models. So here, the uh, potential energy of each atom I is this linear expansion in terms of the descriptors, Bi. And the betas are the fitting coefficients. So you can just fit this uh, with least squares. Next level of complexity is using a quadratic kernel. So we have the same linear model with this extra quadratic term here. And this looks like an outer product of the descriptors with a fitting coefficient matrix alpha. So this adds more fitting coefficients. It also increases your body order because we end up multiplying descriptors. You can also fit this with these squares. And then the next level of complexity are the neural network potentials. So here we have the weight matrices W with layers of activation functions, sigma, where the descriptors BI are our input. Again, to predict the per atom energies EI. So the point is that you can take any descriptor implementation in LAMPS, for example, and plug it into these uh, different models. And that's important because these different models have their uh, pros and cons. For example, linear and quadratic models are relatively fast to fit, just using uh, least squares. And therefore, you can loop in more uh, expensive, maybe important objective functions, uh, like Ember was showing earlier. But neural networks, on the other hand, are more flexible. They're just more costly to train. So you got to really weigh the pros and cons of these different models for your particular application. So uh, for the study that we're just doing here, um, I'll explain the data sets that we're going to look at. These are all AIMD data sets. We're going to look at equilibrium properties. So things like uh, transport properties and liquid structure evaluated at equilibrium. So we're going to look at uh, phonons, phonons in the solid state and liquid structure in the liquid state of silicon. Um, a little bit more complicated with the two element uh, Wurtzite structured gallium nitride system. We're going to look at phonon transport here. And then also with uh, four, uh, a little bit more complicated with four elements, we're going to look at super ionic diffusion and the lithium germanium phosphorus sulfide material. So um, let's start with the simplest, which is silicon first. So we're trying to find ways to fairly compare all the models irrespective of external hyperparameters. And I'm specifically highlighting the energy and force weights here because these are the hyperparameters that are common to all models in the FitSnap procedure. And, and the plots I'm about to show you, each point is going to be a different energy force weight ratio because we're trying to scan all possibilities. Okay, so this plot is showing the trade-off of energy and force error. This is energy mean absolute validation error on our AIMD data set. 
uh, plotted against the force, mean absolute validation error. And again, each point is a different energy force weight ratio. So we can kind of see this trade off. So the colors are the different models. Blue are the linear models. Red is quadratic. Gray are relatively small neural networks. Same number of fitting parameters as quadratic, roughly. And then um, black are larger neural networks. So hundreds of thousands or millions of fitting parameters. And we're only using snap descriptors here. So JMAX3 is a snap setting. This means 30 descriptors. 4, JMAX4 means 56 descriptors. But in all cases, you see that as we complicate the model, the force error saturates at lower and lower errors. And interestingly, the smaller neural networks saturate at similar levels uh, compared to the quadratic models. You really got to go to much larger neural networks, hundreds of thousands or millions of parameters to beat the relatively simple quadratic models. And this concept of force saturation is important because it allows us to fairly compare how different models are able to match the shape or the force of the potential energy surface. And we also find a correlation between this force error and properties calculated at equilibrium. And this is not in disagreement with um, some of the stuff Ember was saying earlier, because properties at equilibrium usually know a structure. You're just sampling a small phase space around that structure. So it makes sense the dynamics and the forces might matter a bit there. But in more complicated things like what Ember is studying with these dispersoids and other scenarios, uh, and like a tungsten matrix, for example, uh, you might find a different uh, scenario. So let's look at some properties. Uh, this is the error and radial distribution function with respect to DFT. This is the RDF error versus the force error of the different models. You see uh, somewhat of a positive correlation where the best models definitely have the best RDF error. Sometimes you can get lucky, basically, and get the right answer for the wrong reason, um, kind of like we see out here. But overall, there's basically a slight positive correlation. Uh, you see more of a trend for solid state properties that depend more on vibration and force constants. So this is phonon uh, mean percent error across the Brulin zone here, um, plotted as a function of the force error. You see a more discernible positive uh, slope here in um, comparing the errors. Now let's look at a, another higher order property. This is thermal conductivity mean percent error with respect to DFT uh, in the 100 Kelvin to 1000 Kelvin temperature range, again, uh, versus force error of the models. And sometimes uh, with these higher order properties, you can get this sort of cancellation of errors effect where you get the right, a decent answer at least, for basically the wrong reason. So you just got to watch out for that. But across the board, um, the models with the best force error, the most flexible models, quadratic and neural network snap are able to simultaneously model the liquid and the solid state properties like phonon uh, frequencies within 1% and thermal conductivity uh, less than 10% or so. So that's single element. Let's take a little bit, uh, a little bit of a leap in complication and go to multi-element. Let's look at two element gallium nitride. Um, multiple element is interesting because different descriptors treat multiple elements differently. So the standard implementation of SNAP, for example, does this weighted average of elements, uh, element types in an environment, whereas uh, the ACE, the atomic cluster expansion, can treat element types explicitly. So in ACE, each element-element pair can have a different set of fitting coefficients, a different set of descriptors, therefore it's more flexible. So you see the effect of that here with linear ACE, which are the blue diamonds. Um, the force error is almost saturating at a similar level compared to the quadratic and neural network snap. And then neural network ACE, which is fit using fit snap. Um, it's a flexible model and a flexible descriptor. You see it beats everything in terms of the force saturation error. So let's see the effect on properties with this. So again, this is a phonon frequency error um, across the Brulin zone for gallium nitride plotted against the force error. Again, we see this uh, strong positive correlation, definitely with some outliers where some uh, models have decently have decent force errors, but they still get quite worse uh, in the phonon frequency errors. And then let's look at this higher order property, thermal conductivity. Um, again, this positive slope, but sometimes you can get this uh, decent answer, maybe 10% thermal conductivity. You're basically getting this for the wrong reasons. And if you want to study why material properties behave the way they do or you know, the underlying reason behind them, I think this is pretty important to watch out for. But across the board, uh, the most flexible models, quadratic SNAP, neural network SNAP, and even linear ACE can model these properties quite well. Three so that's minutes. two element. Thank you. 
That's two elements. Let's go into four elements now. So this is a lithium, germanium, phosphorus, sulfide. Uh, these lithium ion conductors are interesting systems because these red uh, lithium ions kind of diffuse through the solid like a liquid. These are pretty hard systems to stabilize in MD. And right off the bat, uh, we see uh, just taking the same snap descriptors, feeding them, them into a linear or neural network model is more than a twofold improvement in forces. But when, when we go ahead and look at the structure of the lithium ions, the radial distribution function here, you see there's not that much of a difference actually, uh, despite this force error. So this is uh, the, the darker lines are AIMD, the dashed lines are neural network and linear models, not that much of a difference. So to, to see the effect of force, you really gotta take a closer look at the lithium ion dynamics. So here, for example, we have uh, three models made from FitSnap. Um, basically, as we decrease the force error by either complicating the descriptor or the model, the um, mean square displacement versus correlation time curve ends up matching pretty closely with what we get from AIMD. So this basically says this is a very good hallmark that we're matching the AIMD dynamics of the lithium ions. So you can do this with a lot of tools we've made. You can uh, do this with FitSnap and tune the model complexity. You can deploy the models then in LAMPS via the MLIP package. And I don't have time to talk about it, but there's also the MLPOD package in LAMPS, which you can fit linear models directly with the LAMPS input script and then deploy for MD as well. So to conclude, we've made a lot of tools um, that mesh natively with LAMPS to train ML potentials and deploy them for high performance MD. We showed model complexity correlates with force error, correlates with equilibrium property error. This is important because it's quite different than maybe some of the things Ember was explaining earlier. These are relatively simple properties. We're just uh, sampling phase space about unknown structure. This is important because you can choose models complex enough for your particular application. Uh, we have a lot of flexibility here and you can check out the preprint on this study and the methods that's on archive here. And I think these tools open up the doors to a lot of future studies that can be done on pros and cons of linear and nonlinear models for extrapolation, uh, uncertainty capabilities. And we gotta look beyond equilibrium as well. Maybe there are pros and cons for things like chemical reactions and phase changes. And how do we tell which models to use in some scenario? So that concludes my talk, thank you. Thanks, Drew. Um, yep. So we have a uh, time for one question. Uh, what was the biggest side of the size of the workload in number of atoms you have simulated with the SNAP neural network model? Um, I've gone up to 100,000 atoms for a non-equilibrium calculation of interface conductance. Um, I haven't really had a need yet to go beyond that. And also neural network SNAP is um, not ported to Cocos, not on GPUs yet, like the linear counterpart and quadratic. But um, on CPUs, 100,000 atoms was uh, fine. It's basically, it's uh, eight times slower roughly than uh, the linear model. The, the best neural network model is roughly eight times slower than, than the uh, cheapest linear model. We use the same exact descriptors, then that's at roughly a factor of two or three slower, actually. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, yeah check, check Slack. There was some more discussion. I think Mitch answered a question, but, but uh, take a look. Awesome, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, our uh, last contributed talk of this session is Eli Tadmore from the University of Minnesota. We'll be talking about OpenKim, machine learning tools based, uh, machine learning based tools to develop, test, select, and deploy advanced interatomic potentials. All right, thank you. Can people hear me and see my screen? Yeah, looks good. All right, cool. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for letting me present. Um, I'm gonna tell you about a, a little bit about OpenKim. Some of you have already heard a talk, an intro talk by Ilya Nikiforov on uh, yesterday. And then there's another um, breakout session with a lot more technical details on Friday. So I'm gonna kind of give a, a more overview and in particular focus on things that are new uh, coming from the OpenKim project. Uh, there are lots of people in, engaged. I can't go through all the names, uh, but, but uh, many people are involved in this project, and we are grateful for the support of the National Science Foundation, uh, long-term support since 2009, and, uh, and also more recently from uh, the DOE. Um, so 
Open Kim, for those of you that don't know, is from your perspective as users of LAMPS is primarily a repository of interatomic uh, potentials. Uh, there's a lot more than that, as, as you'll see uh, in a little bit later. Uh, currently, we have about 634, 640 interatomic potentials, and with many more in the pipeline that will be coming online soon. Um, now, every potential within the OpenKIM system has a name that, by which we refer to it and is a, given a DOI for citation purposes. Uh, for example, a typical name you, you can see here has a, a specific format. It's the type of the potential, the names of the authors, uh, the year it was published, the elements. And then this code is an internal KIM code that identifies the potential within our system and a version tracking uh, number so that uh, when modifications are made to a potential, we track those. And it's important to understand that OpenKIM tracks actual code, the simulation code for the potential, as well as the parameters, which makes it possible to reproduce work uh, down the line. Now, if you're looking for a potential, you can go to openkim.org. You can click on an element. Um, that'll take you to a browse page where you can further drill down by adding a different additional species and see the list of all the potentials uh, that we have for that system. And if you click on any one of these things, it takes you to what we call the model page, the page for the potential, where there's a lot more information about that potential. To use a potential like this, you have to install, first you have to install the OpenKIM system on your computer. It's basically an OpenKIM library and all of the potentials within our system. Uh, you can install it by uh, from source or using pack various package managers. Uh, once you've done that, you simply run LAMPS the way you usually run LAMPS. Um, the only difference is that when you, uh, instead of using pair styles and things like that, you use the Kim init command to specify a potential. And you can see the type of code I was mentioning before. Um, and then down here, Kim interactions is the mapping between atom types and uh, atomic species. Uh, there are also all sorts of other things you can do, like a King Query command will actually go to the website and get the lattice constant predicted by this potential for a specific system, things like that. And um, Ilya will talk more about that on Friday. And then you run. And when you run your simulation, your code is sitting in here, like say LAMPS, although Kim is portable across many codes beyond LAMPS. Uh, but in any case, your simulation code is sitting here on top of the library of potentials and it works seamlessly. Uh, as far as you're concerned, the only thing you need to do is give this ID. The rest happens under the hood. Uh, a nice side effect or feature is that when your code is uh, run, when LAMPS is done running, uh, it provides all the citation information that you need to cite the potentials that you used. Uh, for example, Stillinger Weber. And importantly, it doesn't just cite the original uh, reference, but it also cites the actual code that was used in the simulation. That's important both for reproducibility and to give credit to the people who spent their time writing the code that you're using. Uh, I think that can't be understated how important that is. Uh, more and more of the work we do is, is uh, code and software packages, and we have to recognize that and cite that work uh, when, when you use it. Um, now, I said OpenKIM is more than just a repository. We also extensively test everything in our system. We have what are called verification checks, which check that the model is coded correctly. For example, that it's rotationally translationally invariant, that it returns forces correctly and so on, and validation tests, which are property calculations. Now we are in the process of completely redesigning our testing uh, framework within a framework we're calling Crystal Genome. It's basically a completely comprehensive framework for modeling uh, all crystal structures known, all known crystal structures. We're doing this in collaboration with the AFLOW DFT repository project. Um, and it basically works like this. The system scans through all the prototypes of uh, crystal prototypes that are in the AFLOW system. Each of these represents a particular crystal type, the, uh, the uh, composition, uh, symmetry, and so on. It's this, these prototypes are AFLOW prototypes. We scan through all these prototypes. We then scan through all of the compounds that crystallize in these prototypes. We then, for each one of these, we look within the OpenKIM repository to detect what potentials we have that support, say, cadmium magnesium in this case. And then we do a, a series of property calculations based on those. 
uh, crystal structure, cohesive energy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we proceed to the next IP for cadmium magnesium that supports cadmium and magnesium. And then we go on to the next compound and so on. And so currently we, we've implemented, and this is already launched uh, um, uh, for, for uh, equilibrium crystal structures. And we're building up all of our testing on top of that. Elastic constants are gonna be coming soon for these systems. And then we're building up all the other ones that we have within our system, uh, surface energies, uh, dislocation properties, et cetera, et cetera, as we're moving through the system. And this is particularly exciting with the, with the large numbers of machine learning potentials like SNAP that we just heard about, where these predictions are not just validations on the potentials anymore, but are actually predictions of values that can be useful for you, uh, things that are larger that cannot be in something like materials project or A-flow that we can compute within our system. So you should set, definitely stay tuned to that as more and more tests come online. Uh, we've also developed a series of ways to compare potentials to help you select a suitable potential for your application. Um, the first one is we call the comparison tool. It's a consumer report style tool. If you're familiar with that interface, uh, like if you were buying a car or refrigerator, basically you select a bunch of potentials you're interested in. You select a bunch of properties that you're interested in. The system pulls in DFT data or, or experimental data that we have to compare with. The color coding here indicates accuracy relative to the reference data for all of these properties for these potentials. Uh, you can set the ranges of what you consider green or yellow or red in terms of percent errors. You can then define a, a cost function or an error function which weights these errors based on criteria that you've decided. And then you can plot error versus computation time to help you select a suitable potential. Right, the you want to be down here, right, uh, in the corner, low error and low computation time. In reality, you have to compromise somehow, and this allows you to do that uh, in in a, a dynamic fashion. You can change all these parameters. What you do, you can change the weight, and you can see how this affects things, and make your selection. Uh, second, we've developed a system we call Deep Citation. Um, this is a system that looks at all of the papers, the journal papers that have cited a potential in our system and uses a, a, a natural language processing machine learning approach to determine did the paper actually use the potential in the simulation or is it just a reference citation? That's something quite useful for people who want to use a potential because then you can go back and look at, okay, how was this potential used in the past and go look at those papers. Um, so it is rather a complicated uh, picture. I can't go through every single detail, but basically we have a potential, like say the Tursoff potential. The primary source is the is Tursoff's original article where he cited where not where he uh, introduced this potential. And then there are many many citing papers, papers that cite Tursoff's paper, and we look at those papers. And we do an analysis of, of the context in which the Tursoff paper is mentioned in the citing paper. So this is some paper by somebody who uh, came after Tursoff who cited Tursoff. And they say somewhere in their paper, the Tursoff bond order potential was employed to describe atomic forces. So the algorithm detects this and says, okay, yeah, this is this used it. This is actually a, a paper that used this thing. Whereas if the citation context said something like, and another example of a potential useful for silicon is Tursoff, that, that would be picked up as something that didn't use it. And it uses uh, uh, language models like Cybert, BERT, uh, except we've adapted them to our needs here and gives a label, as I say, used or not used. All of that is, has been done, uh, is done in the background and is displayed on our website. So if you go to any potential like Stillinger Weber, what you get is a graph that looks like this. Uh, this is every year, how many times the Stillinger Weber, in this case, potential was cited. Blue means it was a, a citation that just was a background citation, and green means used. Uh, if you look down here, you see a list of all of the papers that cited Tursoff, and all the ones with the green stars are ones that um, uh, are indicated to have been used by, uh, by uh, uh, the authors. Uh, if you click on the link, it'll take you to the Semantic Scholar uh, page for that paper, and from there you can go to the original source. Uh, we're doing this work, by the way, in collaboration with Semantic Scholar to get access to the PDFs that we process for this. Uh, now, if we get it wrong, you know, uh, the, it's, after all, it's just a machine learning algorithm. If it gets it wrong, 
uh, and you know that it was used and it wasn't or vice versa, you can click this little uh, cloud icon here or, or talking icon and you can let us know and that information will be updated in the system. Uh, we also generate a word cloud from all of the papers that used the potential. So you kind of get a sense of what this potential is being used for where larger words mean used more often in the past. Um, we then have built on top of the things I just described, a recommender system, a system, an automated system to help pick a potential for your needs. You provide to it two things uh, or up to two things. You can provide just a text-based uh, language query saying, I'd like a potential for X, Y, Z. And you can upload a configuration, an atomic configuration that is representative of what you want to simulate. And the system basically uses all of these informations to rank the potentials for you. So again, I don't have enough time to really go into a lot of details, but basically it looks at all of the papers that cite the potentials for your particular material system, let's say silicon. This is the text query that was given, silicon low dimensional materials, silicine nanotubes. This is what you wrote that you want. And then it gives this, um, this is a distribution of all the papers based on a BM25 text relevance score that tells you how closely related it is to your query here. So the higher the number, the more relevant it is for you. And that information right here is already used to make some recommendations. On top of that, there's a second layer which looks at all of the papers that have cited all of the potentials in our system, takes your text query, and looks at the relative relevance of all of these citing papers. It then only uses the ones that only keeps the ones that actually use the potential and then assigns that score to that potential and ranks the potential that way. So in, in other words, what it's doing is if you say, I want a potential for low dimensional materials, it looks how often this has been used in the past to simulate low dimensional materials and is using that information to rank it. Uh, the assumption being that if it's used often, then it's probably useful. Were you trying to say something? Yeah, two minutes left. Okay. Um, and then the third one uses atomic configurations. Uh, this is something we do in collaboration with a project we call uh, a sister project to OpenKIM called CollabFit, where we archive data sets. It basically looks at a bunch of configurations in CollabFit that are similar to the one you want and computes them with all of the potentials that we have in the system looks at the distributions of energies for each of these and is then measuring the distance between the DFT distribution and the distribution generated by these potentials and the, the earth moving distance between them is used as a ranking. So the argument is if the distribution looks pretty similar, then it's probably a good model for that system that you're looking at. Um, and by looking at distributions, we account for systematic errors between DFT codes that uh, uh, might give you a wrong idea. You, you may have the wrong energy, but the right distribution, which is what we're looking for here. Okay, uh, two more things. One is uh, uh, we've just developed a driver for arbitrary machine learning potentials. It means you can develop a PyTorch potential, arbitrary PyTorch machine learning interatomic potentials and use it immediately within LAMPS with no changes whatsoever. It's performant, it's, it does domain de decomposition, it supports GPU, it does auto differentiation and has a large library of descriptors that you can use within your system. Um, okay, this one word on this is that uh, we, we're developing versions of everything that we do that you can run on your own resources. So if you wanna develop potentials and archive them or you have DFT data that you'd like to archive and then use our package Cliff to fit potentials, all of that you can do on your own resources and emulate everything we do online. Uh, this is being done in collaboration with Livermore, that they're using this system to build their uh, an in-house uh, uh, large-scale atomic fitting framework, and we're going to make this available open source to anybody else who'd like to use it. Um, and then the last thing I want to mention is that we have just launched a journal called Kim Review. It's a commentaries journal, so we don't, we're not, there are enough journals out there, so, you know, we're not going to uh, publish new content. But the idea here is to identify key papers in molecular simulation, send it out to expert, uh, experts to comment on, and then we publish these commentaries and allow people to discuss them in a, in a thread. And so these, this uh, Kim Review effort has been kind of in the works for about two years. It's, it's co-edited by Dan Frankel and uh, you know, LAMP's own Steve Plimpton, and there's a distinguished editorial board with it. 
Uh, our first issue just came out today. We, we raced to make this workshop. Mm. And so it's online at kimreview.org. The first commentary is by Christoph Ortner on the atomic cluster expansion. He writes very interesting. It's a very interesting commentary about ACE. If you're interested, I invite you to go to kimreview.org, click on this link here. It will take you to the commentary page where you can read the commentary. And probably by the end of the week, the ability to, um, uh, to do the um, uh, discussion forum will be there. We, we, had to, we're, we have a technical difficulty that we couldn't fix in time for this. But the commentary is there. Plus, there's a long list of commentaries. We have a pipeline of about eight or nine other commentaries that are going to be published soon. And you can nominate a paper by either clicking here or going to kimreview.org contact and tell us who should we ask for, what papers are you interested in to read a commentary on? Uh, plus you should join the mailing list and then every time a new commentary comes on, we'll let you. So with that, I will wrap it up because I'm sure I'm at, my, at the end of my two minute uh, tag. I inv invite you to go to Ilya's uh, tutorial on Friday. He's gonna give you a lot of the technical details on how to use this stuff. I've mentioned a whole bunch of new things that we've been doing. One thing I didn't get to is bonded force fields. We've been working with uh, Jake Gissinger and, uh, and Axel on um, uh, Kohlmeyer on, on supporting bonded force fields using labels within LAMPS. I didn't get to it, but you can go to Jake's talk on Thursday and he'll probably mention it there. And of course, feel free to reach out to us um, at these links for any help or just contact me directly. Thank you. Well, thank you, Elad. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but uh, please check your Slack, the Slack channel. Absolutely. All right. So now we are going to do lightning talks. Um, this is the first time that we've done lightning talks. So uh, just a reminder to the speakers, you have three minutes with no time reserved for questions. So we can uh, do questions in, in the Slack. Um, and I'm going to share the slides. And our first speaker is Rafael Gonzalez. Hi. Hi, thank you, Stan. I will try to be tight on the time. Uh, I will talk to you about molecular dynamic simulation of immobilite using lamps. Um, so I will say you briefly what is this particular nanotube that I have been investigating for the last 10 years or so on using lamps. So this um, nanotube, is a luminosilicate that is of natural origin and can be synthesized by relative simple protocol as, as, as some coll collaborators say that, that are essentially experimental. And this is the, in, in the, um, you, you see what is the uh, unit cell from, from, from the top point of view and uh, along, the, along the, the length of the nanotube. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, please, thank you, Stan. Um, well, what I have been doing is simulation using lamps and the Clave FF force field, that is a, a force field um, that was published in, in 2004, that essentially is a more or less traditional force field with um, long range uh, bonding and non-bonding interaction, and it, it when it was published, it has a, a angular term that was presented as an optional feature. Um, well, we we use it in, in I, I'm showing you showing you in on the right side two papers that we published using these techniques. One was about some some ideas from the from how it, it could be a self rolling for, for this nanotube or something theoretical. And then with, in collaboration with Eduardo Ringa that gave a talk before, uh, we, we observed the mechanical response of the aluminosilicate nanotube under compression. And finally, the last slide uh, is about, uh, well, th there is some improvement to the clay FF uh, formulation that is included in, in, the, in that paper that I, I'm, I'm showing you. And we prove uh, this new improved angular term um, for clay FF and using clay FF and immobilite. And on the left, you can see the, our result about distributions of, of the, of the 
angles in, a, in molecular dynamic simulations at room temperature. And finally, on the right, what we are doing currently, but I don't have enough time. So thank you very much for your attention. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, bye-bye. All right, our next speaker is Daniel Castillo Castro. Did you hear me? Did you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Today, I'd like to share with you some interesting findings on studying BDOS in diamond using molecular dynamics. BDOS, or vibrational density of states, is a useful tool for identifying and understanding defects in diamond. Defects can influence the location, width, and height of BDOS peaks, and we've seen as we've seen in some experimental studies of diamond with defects references we've read. In our research, we, in our research, we performed BDOS calculations using Lamps velocity autocorrelation function results for two cases, an indented spherical diamond nanoparticles of five, 10, and 20 nanometers, and bulk diamond samples with random vacancies from one to 10%. We use a modified Python fast Fourier transform implementation and Ovito for visualization. In our next slide, please, our results show that the high frequency peak reduction was around 14% for the indentation case and the 35% and for the vacancy addition case. You can see it in the interval between 14 and 6, 40 and 60 terahertz. Uh, we also observed the universal linear relationship between strain and dislocations for the indented spherical nanoparticle case and vacancy content for the random vacan random addition case, which suggests that infrared experiments could provide defect densities. This can be seen in the next slide, please. Okay, uh, you can see the relation, the versus dislocation density versus a strain and versus vacancy content compared with some theoretical uh, data we have. Um, these findings highlight the impact of defects on the thermodynamic and vibrational behavior of diamond nanostructures. By understanding how defects affect BDOS peaks, we can gain insights into the properties and behavior of diamond at the nanoscale. This work was submitted in a paper for nanomaterials yesterday. I want to acknowledge to the team I work with, the professors Gonzalez, the, the, last, the last talk, Eduardo Bringa and Felipe Valencia and the students Gonzalo Garcia Vidable and Geraudis Mora Barzaga. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Daniel. Okay, our next speaker is Rita Mahi. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay, so in this talk, I'm going to discuss about uh, how the material properties uh, can be linked uh, in multiscal simulation. And for that, uh, the material I'm going to discuss is uh, polycrystalline silicon. So in this slide, these are the uh, more um, uh, observable uh, types of grain boundaries in polycrystalline silicon. So grain boundary is basically a extended defects uh, separating uh, two grain region, as you can see in the figure. And depending on uh, orientation of two different grains, we can have different types of grain boundaries. And, and based on that, it can have local, uh, different local structure uh, with uh, uh, either a, um, low coordination or high coordination between the silicon atoms. Uh, so in, in this grain boundary mainly works as an efficient segregation sites and uh, for different kind of kinds of defects, uh, which can be interstitial defects or vacancy defects. So initially we, we did a, a detailed study on different kind of defects in this kind of polycrystalline silicon. Uh, where we focus on the segregation mechanism because it depends on type of grain boundary as well as the type of element we are interested. So here we are mostly focused on light impurities like oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, and hydrogen. And depending on different uh, segregation, it, it, it also affect the electronic properties. So now in the next slide, uh, I'm going to discuss about how these electronic properties uh, can be linked to a device. 
So these are the main electronic properties I'm going to discuss, like a band gap, potential barrier, mobility, and the defect state, which is the most crucial part because we have uh, lots of defects in polycrystalline system. And as a device, I'm going to discuss about two devices. Uh, one is 3D NAN and another is the TFT, where the channel region is made of polysilicon. Now in this device, if we use those material properties and we simulate uh, the device, uh, where we can uh, in in the in the right side plot you will see the different figure of merits that we can calculate uh, for different devices and here I have focused only on one of the figure of merit how it uh, uh, basically changed if we have different set of uh, material uh, properties based on different polysilicon uh, system. So in this plot, uh, the on current is plotted for different concentration of uh, defect density as well as different number of grain boundaries in the polysilicon. So in the highlighted green box, you will see that depending on the defect density as well as the number of grain boundaries, there is a lowering in the on current. So uh, we can uh, conclude that uh, the grain boundary properties and the grain diameter, that means uh, more number of grain boundaries or less number of grain boundaries has a crucial impact on the device functionality. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Rita. Our next speaker is Arifan Mustafa Anik. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'll be presenting the modeling of random session in linear polymer chains. Uh, the main motivation behind this study is to model polymer degradation in mesoscale. The goal is to study randomization in polymer using energy conserving dissipative particle dynamics. Uh, so in EDPD, the energy is conserved here. Uh, and also uh, the probability of session depends on the local uh, temperature. So as the temperature increases, the probability of bond breaking also increases. Uh, modified uh, signature repulsive potential has also been applied here to prevent bond washing. Uh, MSRP uh, adds additional forces that avoid uh, unphysical crossing of bonds uh, and produce entanglements. Uh, MSRP react has been applied, which modifies the MSRP for the bond breaking uh, processes. So prior to degradation, the milk is equilibrated and in our image, as you can see, five chains are shown for clarity. After degradation, the polymer fragments increases as shown by the second uh, image. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so to characterize degradation process, where can number fractions are tracked? Here in is the number of chains with I bits, and X is the fraction of bonds broken. So longer simulation means more bonds are broken, so the value of X uh, increases and there is a higher percentage of smaller fragments as shown by the weight of the number fraction uh, graphs. It can be seen that the fraction follows a Florentius distribution, also known as the most probable distribution. So, uh, next slide, please. So, to summarize, uh, we introduce the initial uh, framework to model random station using EDPD. Uh, here, the probability of bond breaking depends on the local temperature. Uh, in future, uh, ways to study degradation on the temperature ramp. We also plan to study degradation in uh, local thermal gradients. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Luzina and K. Simpson for the discussion and uh, our uh, funding support, MSF. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you very much. And our, our next speaker is Matthew Bone. Hello, everybody. I'm, my name's Matt, and I am the founder of Molydyne. We are a UK-based software company working to make computational chemistry more accessible to laboratory chemists and people without computational experience. So we have been uh, carrying out a lot of conversations with people in both in academia and industry, and many of them do not use any form of chemical simulation to support their research. There's a number of reasons that come up time and again. The first being that many aren't familiar with what's capable in modern simulations. They don't tend to follow the literature. But once we've shown them what's available, the general theme is that people feel that they lack pro programming expertise to set up these simulations themselves, that they're limited by the computing resources that they have available to them, 
And there's a general feeling of being overwhelmed and not knowing where to start with so many different software tools and packages available. Interestingly, it's been very rarely the case that people have said that simulation isn't suitable for what they're interested in. So there is a real need to show people that simulation isn't as hard to set up as they think. And that's what Molydine is working on. We're trying to reduce the learning curve of getting beginners into tools like LAMPS. And we're trying to support researchers who are experienced with something like LAMPS to help them work faster and save them the effort of doing lots of manual pre-processing work themselves. On top of that, we then want to push this further to help us characterize common material properties and automate a lot of typical tools that people use when it comes to chemical simulation. Next slide, please. To do this, then, we have built a platform called Atlas, which is available now. And how it works is that we run LAMPS through a web platform, so there's no installation needed. And we carry out all of our simulations using the cloud. So again, there's no computational resource management people need to be familiar with. We are focusing on polymer and liquid simulations. So we are currently able to support things like blended mixtures, as well as setting up polymer simulations for tools like Fixed Bond React in LAMPS. We are looking always for feedback from new users. We're bringing out updates very regularly and taking requests for what people are interested in. So if you want to see what we've got, then I'd recommend uh, using the QR code to sign up for Atlas or sign up to our newsletter and we'll keep you posted as we continue to develop. Thank you all for listening. If you have any questions, I'll be in the Slack. Cheers. Thank you, Matt. And our final lightning talk is Franco Aquista Pace. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, my name is Franco. I'll be talking about identifying structures and defects with a machine learning algorithm called Multisum, which is a free and open source algorithm we developed. It is a clustering method, which means it relies on unsupervised learning. As input data, it takes uh, atomic descriptors, which can be coordination numbers, center of symmetry parameters, potential energy, uh, but any atomic descriptor can be used. We have previously used this software to identify crystalline structures, surfaces, and defects. And we are using Ovito to analyze the results. Next slide, please. Uh, today, I wanted to focus on some new results we have obtained. First, an iron copper nanoparticle under irradiation. And with Multism, we have identified all of the crystalline structures in the nanoparticle but we have additionally identified the surface and the atoms surrounding vacancies, which is something that algorithms such as CNA and PTM cannot do. There is a remaining challenge of quantifying these uh, vacancies, and this is difficult because of vacancy clustering. Next, we perform a benchmark test to compare the ability of Multisum to identify BCC atoms and we found out that um, multisum reduces the error of a classification by three orders of magnitude with respect to PTM. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, I wanted to focus on a diamond nanoparticle we have been studying. Uh, we have load and unload this uh, nanoparticle with a flat indenter. And using the Multisum software, we have identified, again, all of the crystalline structures present in the nanoparticle. And additionally, we identified the surface, the dislocations, and some amorphization. And from the dislocations we, we can find, we estimate the dislocation density. And we can then compare that dislocation density with that found with DX8. We have found that DXA underestimates this uh, density dislocation, and this is because uh, DXA relies on common neighbor analysis for structure identification, which behaves uh, poorly for diamond under high strains. I want to acknowledge all of the fellow co-workers that participate in these uh, projects. Nicolás Amigo, Javier Troncoso, Orlando de Luigi, Eduardo Bringa, Diego Tramontina, Gonzalo García Vidable, Rafael Gonzalez and Daniel Castillo. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Franco. And thank you to everyone in this session. Um, so we will now be on break until 12.55 p.m. Eastern time.
you want it cooked or you want it raw? No, that one that you put on like the smoking. Is for, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you want the piece of meat, you just go to a butcher. Hey, Axel, can you mute? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started with our first talk in a couple of minutes. Welcome to the uh, second part of day two of the um, Eighth Lamps Tutorial and Symposium. My name is Aidan Thompson. I will be uh, chairing the, the second half of day two. Um, we're going to have a couple of very nice and uh, contributor talks and at 2 p.m. Professor Teresa Head Gordon of UC Berkeley will give an invited talk and uh, at 2.50 p.m. we'll have a sequence of lightning talks and we'll close out the day two at 3.08 p.m. in about two hours from now. James, would you like to try sharing your screen and check your audio? Certainly. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we hear you good. Looks great. <clears throat> Perfect. You can just leave that up there. It'll, uh, it'll be a good... Uh, placeholder for the session before we get started. Okay. I should uh, comment to all attendees, <clears throat> whether they be on Zoom or on YouTube, uh, that there won't be an opportunity for most people to verbally ask questions, but you can post questions on the uh, <clears throat> LAMPS Workshop 2023 Slack site, um, and please post them in the channel called General. Do, do not post them in the channel called Talks.
with that, I think we can go ahead and get started. I'm going to hand it over to our first speaker, James Goff from Sandia. The title of his talk is Machine Learned ACE Models with Charge Equilibration in LAMPS. Take it away, James. All right, thank you, Aidan. Um, and thank you all for joining. And I'd like to take a moment to thank the organizers for setting this up as well. I appreciate the opportunity to talk. Uh, so we'll just jump right in with this. Uh, thank you for the introduction and the title slide um, reading. We'll just go into the content. So to charge or not to charge, uh, that is the question. So we're doing all this great work with intertongue potentials. And a lot of the times we don't include charge. Uh, in some cases, that's okay. Uh, in other cases, it's, it's not such a good deal. If we want to look at things like hydrogen bonding or solvation in water, or look at reactive systems with a lot of charge transfer, like metal oxidation, then including long-range charges is pretty important, uh, and especially charges that change as a function of time or as a function of bond environment. And this is especially a problem in our machine learned intertongue potentials that have become so popularized nowadays. You know, as we discussed a little bit in the, the nice keynote talk this morning, uh, we don't tend to include long range electrostatics in many of our machine learning potentials. And it almost seems because of our, our local descriptions of atomic interactions, that they're kind of fundamentally incompatible with them. Uh, but there may be some ways we can use machine learning to help improve the way we look at charge in our intertronic potentials. And that's really what today's talk is about. Uh, specifically, we have new machine learning methods and models that are pretty well suited for looking at charge. Atomic cluster expansions specifically are pretty great, and we'll see why in just a second. Uh, but first off, they, they have a nice clean definition. If you look at this uh, equation or pseudo-mathematical equation in the upper left, you'll see that a property such as the energy can be expanded as two-body, three-body, four-body, and so on contributions. And those contributions are given in terms of ACE descriptors, or these Bs. Uh, and those ACE descriptors can be set up such that they depend on charge transfer in a very natural way. Uh, so this is a great thing to look into if we're thinking about improving the way we look at charge in intertronic potentials. And on top of that, they're pretty performant if we compare them to other machine learning potential methods, uh, like in this Pareto front plot on the right. Uh, you can see that they're pretty performant and they do well in this copper system, and they do well in many other systems too. So be thinking about using ACE to address some of the shortcomings of uh, charges and intertongue potentials. The way we might start including charge in our first potentials is similar to the way we've done it in the past. Uh, we add in a long range electrostatic term. Uh, there are many ways to do that already in LAMPS. So we have a lot of documentation, a lot of methods already implemented and uh, including things like a Coulomb term, it's probably a little bit more mainstream. Uh, the things that are a little bit less mainstream is how we equilibrate charges or how we find the charge on atoms in different atomic environments. Uh, QEQ is one of the most common, but there are others. Uh, these schemes can be used to start looking at the problems we're interested in. So thinking about those challenging problems like metal oxidation, um, we, we can start doing that with charge equilibration and just adding in a Coulomb term kind of like this. Um, big thing is though, is there are problems with some of these charge equilibration methods. Uh, QEQ is not the best. And the reason why it's used is because it has pretty good performance. If you look at this performance plot on the right, you can see that a REACTS model using QEQ is very performant, has decent parallel scaling. Uh, and there's a lot of great science we can do with performance that's this good. Uh, however, if we look at QEQ, it has some problems. And, and one of them I'm demonstrating here on the left, if you take a diatomic molecule and dissociate it, you still have finite charge transfer at infinite separation. And that's pretty unphysical. And that, that charge transfer is proportional to the difference in electronegativities of those two atoms. So electronegativity drives the charge transfer in QEQ and it leads to problems. It's a pretty simple model. Uh, other methods that are discussed in this paper, like OX2, uh, start to get around this and, and you fix some of these spurious behaviors, but they are a lot more expensive or, or they tend to be. Uh, but that performance is so nice. So is there a way we can use machine learning to leverage um, this performance still while we start to correct some of the spurious behavior? 
We'll be thinking about ACE as we do so. And that's really where our method comes in. Uh, we use this extended Lagrangian charge of calibration scheme to help maintain or even improve the computational efficiency of charge of calibration uh, in our models, while we also use a machine learning model of the ledger negativity itself. Uh, we'll see some benefits of both of those in just a second, um, but this is, this is kind of the big kicker. You have a driving force for charge transfer that changes based on the bonding environment, uh, and that leads to a lot more physical behavior. Uh, overall, our models will look something like they do at the top here. You have a short range potential that's described as an ACE, and then a long range term where the charges come from ACE electronegativities. Overall benefits of all this is faster charge calibration. And through this shadow MD scheme or this extended Lagrangian scheme, we actually conserve important properties like the total energy, uh, which is very powerful. And then just, just from this machine learning model of electronegativity itself, uh, we, we don't fix all of the problems with QEQ, but we start to do a little bit. Uh, for example, that finite charge transfer for those infinitely separated atoms, that can go away. Uh, so we start to correct some of the spurious behavior just by switching to this more adaptive driving force for charge transfer. Uh, so we build models like this and we use them in lamps. And, and what does that look like? Uh, as, I, as I hinted at before, you know, we have ACE models for short range energetics and for the uh, electronegativities. And this is already implemented in LAMPS. We're able to use tools with the ML PACE package in LAMPS developed by Ralph Droughts and his group and uh, code from the Los Alamos uh, laboratory in the LATTE code here. Uh, we have a feedback loop between those two so we can drive charge of calibration uh, between these new adaptive electronegativity models and our um, molecular dynamics here. Uh, so, so this is a big kicker, uh, a multi-property model where now our electronegativity changes as our system changes in our trajectory. Uh, well, we have a way to run these models or a way to uh, stick them in lamps now. The, the next piece was training some. Uh, as we developed this method, we, we chose a couple systems that would be good demonstrations, uh, namely a solid state system, uranium dioxide, as well as a molecular system, water, you know, the, the good easy one. And um, we trained those short range potentials first. We, we got some uh, pretty nice ACE models for both uranium and uh, water. Uh, the errors are given in those first two rows of that table at the bottom left for those. And um, the electronegativity models are the final two rows. Uh, so we're training both of those on first principles training data using workflow discussed by uh, Ember and Drew this morning. So I won't go over that too much, but we are using FitSnap with this LAMPS backend to drive the training of these models. Uh, and we do so in a way that, uh, yes, we try to reach thresholds in uh, our, our root mean square errors, but we also try to achieve dynamic stability in simulations. Uh, so we train these models. You can do this using tools and LAMPS and FitSnap right now, uh, but I'd really like to highlight what you gain by switching to something that's a little bit more flexible, like this machine learned ACE model for electronegativity. Uh, to see what this looks like in lamps, you have electronegativities that change as a function of time and bond environment. So in this example, I'm showing a simulation of a uranium dioxide cell with a vacancy introduced. Oxygen is close to that vacancy are more electronegative. They're, they're more ready to receive charge than an oxygen far from the vacancy. Not only is this more intuitive, just physically and chemically, uh, it's also in better agreement with our ground truth data or ab initio data. If we were to compare this to uh, what we see from our training data, we see that ACE correctly predicts our electronegativity changes based on the chemical environments. Uh, what does that mean ultimately? It means more accurate charges and more accurate uh, Coulomb energies as we go through our simulation. I, I know what you're thinking though. We just introduced a flexible electronegativity that changes with time. Uh, how can that be stable during your simulation? Uh, and many thanks to the very, very clever extended Lagrangian scheme implemented from Los Alamos, we're able to get very stable uh, simulations. As I mentioned before, we do conserve energy. If you look at the energy drift for MVE simulations, uh, it's negligible. And um, th this is true for uranium dioxide in this example I'm showing here, but also in water, uh, which I'm not showing, but I can share if somebody's interested at the end. 
And um, beyond that, beyond these stable uh, charge dynamic simulations, we get more information. And that's what this color map on the right is showing. Uh, this gives you the difference in charges between our flexible electronegativity charge calibration scheme and traditional QEQ. So this is really the charge information you gain by switching to this method. And you can see that it's, it's really new charge information around a perturbation, around this vacancy. Um, and it's supported by better energetics um, for, for Coulomb interactions with, with our training data. Uh, so better charges, better energetics, and good stability. Um, and we're able to do, uh, essentially what, what all this is highlighted is some of the first MD simulations using machine learned models of electronegativity. The machine learned models of electronegativity have been built before. They haven't really been used in molecular dynamic simulations. I think this is in large part due to the lack of stability of these models in the past, but using these very stable extended Lagrangian schemes, we're able to do so uh, with, with pretty good computational efficiency. Uh, this is available in LAMPS. We, we um, kind of developed these capabilities in LAMPS and FITSNAP so they could be used in the future. Uh, and the tools for training them, again, uh, FITSNAP uses LAMPS as a backend and is also public too. Uh, any additional tools to fit other parameters or, or models within this uh, can be trained using PyLAMPS, which I'd be happy to talk about more if somebody's interested. Uh, but with that, I'm, I'm about out of time, so I'm going to have to wrap it up. I'd like to take this time to thank my collaborators and my co-authors, especially Drew Ropskoff for uh, helping with this LAMPS interface a good bit, uh, and also my collaborators at Los Alamos for uh, making some very innovative changes to charge collaboration to make this possible. Uh, do have a little bit of blatant advertisement here for this paper that describes this method, but can't go into all the dirty details here in a 12-minute talk. So... Uh, please check that out if you, if you have more questions or, or you're interested. Um, and of course, I'll take anything you have in the Slack now or in the chat. Thank you. Thanks, James. Um, if anybody on the panel has a question, there's a little bit of time to ask him uh, verbally. We also have one question on the Slack, which is of a general nature. It's asking if there are... Uh, tutorials for learning how to train these types of ML models on DFT data? That's a good question. There aren't tutorials, um, but as, as we move along, uh, we will be making some documentation on this. Uh, as you can imagine, there, there's a few different ways you could go about doing this. And um, in this study, we have tried multiple methods. Um, so, so it can certainly be something we add to the documentation as we update this and make it kind of a more formal capability in LAMPS. Um, yeah, it's good to know your interest. It's not there, though. Another question is, what is the computational expense of ACE charge equilibration versus ACKS AX? Yeah, so this, this charge equilibration Actually. scheme. Yeah, it's a good, that's a great question. Um, so ACE charge equilibration, the, the main kind of piece there is this extended Lagrangian QEQ. So you, you'll have a performance um, similar or maybe even a bit better than traditional QEQ. Uh, and, and it might be comparable or, or around where you see in that, um, that reference I showed at the beginning uh, with that REACTS model. Um, my guess is with this new extended Lagrangian scheme, it might be a bit faster, but we need to do more thorough testing. Uh, the additional ACE model doesn't add much extra cost itself. It's, it's, a, it's like doubling the size of your ACE model, which by itself is, is not too significant. And with that, I think we can move on to our next uh, speaker. If they would please share their screen. Uh, the next talk will be given by... Ludwig Ahrens Evers from Hamburg University of Technology. The title is Electrode Package Implementation of the Constant Potential Method. Take it away, Ludwig. Yes, uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And okay. your slide looks good. Um, I will be talking about the Electrode Package. So this has been written by Robert Meissner, T and me. And I think John T has presented a 
an, an early version of this uh, two years ago <coughs> at this occasion. And um, the key feature of this electro package is the implementation of the constant potential method. So in order to illustrate what a model with a constant potential method would look like, I'm showing you this uh, supercapacitor. So this is a very typical model. We've got uh, two electrodes left and right. And then in between, we've got the electrolyte. And now um, due to this applied uh, potential difference, we expect a charge accumulation on the electrodes. So that's what you see in blue and in red on the electrodes. And this is this charge is uh, not just due to the potential difference, but also due to the electrolyte. So the total dipole of the electrolyte and also the local geometries. For example, here you can see an ion and then the, as a result, as a charge induced on the electrode. So I want to go quickly over some methods that can model such a system. So the most um, simple version to do this would be the constant atom charges. Here you just put uniform charges on your electrodes and don't uh, change them at all. So on the upside, of course, it's very simple, just two lines in, in your lamps input, but uh, your potential difference will not be constant because your electrolyte is moving around. So the next step is then to use a constant dipole, which is here in the middle. And here you measure the dipole of your electrolyte and then accordingly change uh, the uniform charges on your electrodes. And this way you achieve a constant uh, potential difference between your electrodes, but still you don't have this uh, local information for your charges. So in order to achieve this, um, you have to go to the constant potential method. And here uh, you enforce the constant potential at every electrode atom. So you vary the charge of every, every electrode atom in order to achieve the potential at this point. However, this means uh, that you now need to use the electrode package or uh, a package that can implement this method. And I will show you how this uh, works in detail. So mm, this is similar to the charge equilibration scheme. So what we do here is we write the energy in terms of our electrode charges. So this uh, vector Q comprises all the electrode charges. So in this picture, this would be Q0 to Q9. And then we've got uh, three terms that we care about. First one is the electrode-electrode interaction. So this is what you see in this blue arrow from Q4 to Q9. This would be one element of a matrix. And next, we've got the electrolyte electrode interaction. So, this is a vector with an element for each uh, electrode atom. And here we uh, collect all the interactions of the electrolyte on our electrode atoms. And then, last, we've got the applied potential. Of course, there are more terms in this, for example, the electrolyte electrode um, interaction, but we only care about terms that include the electrode charges because now we will minimize the energy with respect to these charges. So that's what we do here. We take the gradient and we arrive at this uh, linear equation. And this linear equation, we will have to solve for Q. And we will have to do this at every time step because uh, this vector B is a function of our electrolyte atom charges and positions. And this will change over time. So there are two tasks here. First, calculate A and B, so the, uh, all the interactions, and then solve the linear equation. For the first task, um, we are, uh, already run into problems because uh, we cannot do it as it's uh, sketched in this picture. We cannot use a cutoff for our uh, interactions because um, the Coulomb interaction is inherently long-ranged. So what we do instead is we use a long-range solver so in the electrode package, we use uh, the eval summation and the particle mesh uh, algorithm. So in the simple eval summation, you might be familiar with this uh, picture, you calculate some of the interaction in, in real space, but here you um, screen your charges with a counter charge that you introduce. This allows you to use a cutoff in real space, but then you have to um, counteract this with interactions in, um, in the Fourier space. So this interaction is calculated in Fourier space. And this is uh, the standard Ewald summation. 
And then if you want to use fast Fourier transform, as you probably do, if you do numerical applications, uh, you need equally distant uh, points. So that means you need to transform your atom charges, which are not equidistant, to a grid. So that's what I've sketched in this picture on the right. You can see that our charges uh, are trans transformed on this grid, which is still in real space. And here you can then um, perform the fast free transform, calculate the interactions, and then transform back onto the atom positions. And uh, currently, the electro package is the only implementation of the constant potential, potential method that makes use um, of the particle mesh algorithm. So this is then how we calculate the interactions, A and B. And as I said, we have to do this every time step. And then the question is still, how do we want to solve this uh, linear equation? And there are two common ways uh, to do this. First one is matrix inversion. So this means you actually calculate all of the elements in your A matrix. So that's the electrode-electrode interaction. And then you invert it, um, which of course is uh, quite expensive to do. But in a special case where your electrodes are frozen, so electrode move, atoms don't move at all, this only has to be done once because your uh, electrode interaction only depends on the positions of your electrode atoms. So if you're really only interested in your electrolyte dynamics and are fine with electrode atoms being frozen, then this works quite nicely for moderate system sizes. And if you look in the literature, this is actually very commonly used. Uh, however, if you need um, moving electrode atoms, so if you want a temperature or moving electrodes in general, then uh, you can use the conjugate gradient algorithm. So here, we compute this left-hand side AQ directly, um, meaning we don't actually uh, compute this matrix at all, which means we get back to the n log n scaling that we expect from the particle mesh algorithm. However, we then have to do this uh, step multiple times in order to do this iterative minimization um, for every time step. So there's a trade-off here. Um, so these are the two steps that always have uh, always have to be done in the electrode package. And there are three different um, variants of this um, fixed electrode um, that you can use. And I want to illustrate this uh, on this uh, on this toy system. So here we've got a tiny capacitor with some electrolyte in the middle. And I will now go over the three cases uh, that are possible. So first one is the closed circuit. So this is the standard uh, constant potential method. You will just apply this uh, constant potential here. And then you see here the reaction of the electrolyte dipole. So at uh, time equals 0, the capacitor is not charged. And then you suddenly turn on the constant potential difference. And this can be invoked by this fixed electrode conk. And then there are two more variants. Second one is uh, this uh, thermal potential state. So this is a bit more niche. Uh, it's very similar to the constant potential method. You just introduce this uh, thermal fluctuation in your system, meaning your potential difference is not actually constant, but uh, varies with a temperature. And this can then be invoked with this uh, fixed electrode thermal. And then lastly, We've got the open circuit circuit uh, conditions. So there's no potential difference enforced here, but rather electrode charges. So imagine your circuit is open. And what you have as input parameters are now the total electrode charges. So the total charge of your electrode here is fixed. However, um, how the charges distribute within the electrodes is um, according to the energy minimization, similar to the constant potential method then. And this can be invoked with a fixed electrode song. And <laughs> as you can see here, your results will be uh, quite different. So for this charging, it probably doesn't make a lot of sense. But even at equilibrium, uh, you can see that you sample differently here. And uh, Sean T recently has uh, written a paper on the differences between constant potential and constant charge method. Uh, next, I quickly want to. I mentioned the different corrections we've got for non-periodic boundaries and the electrode package. So 
And typically, these systems look like this, a capacitor that's uh, periodic in two directions, but in the Z, Z direction, it's not periodic. And because you're using this uh, three-dimensional Fourier space, uh, you have to do a correction in this uh, third direction. And this is also called uh, the Ye backwards correction, where you correct for the dipole and um, include extra vacuum in your case space. Another way, quite recent way um, to do this is the finite field approach. So this is implemented as well. And then there's also the 2D eval summation, um, which is, I think, uh, numerically exact, but uh, has very poor scaling. So we only have done this for the standard eval summation. And then lastly, I quickly want to mention um, one test we have um, recently added. So this is, I call it semi-analytical. So we construct a tiny system with just two electrode atoms and two electrolyte atoms. And here we can um, just write down infinite sums uh, for the interaction with the periodic images and then brute force uh, these energy contributions and compare this to the results from Fourier summation and uh, dipole corrections. So this way we can verify our implementation and uh, we can also benchmark different type of corrections which I've shown in previous slide. With this, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Now, I'm open to question. Thank you very much, Ludwig. Uh, we have one question in the chat already for Ludwig. Uh, I'll read it out to you. It says, uh, instead of using electrodes, can I apply a constant potential to analyze the polarizing effect on bulk crystals? Yes, yes. So um, you can any amount of uh, any number of electrodes. So if you have a lot of crystals, um, you are limited by the number of groups you can define in lamps. And um, yeah, sure. then you can, for example, you could. Uh, um, use the constant charge. So maybe you want to say your crystals are charge neutral and then they will be polarizable. Yes, this is possible. Good. Another question, <clears throat> it's quite long. I'll see if I can get it right. Um, suppose I am using graphite comprising of three layers of graphene as the electrode and I want to apply an external potential of four volts. <laughs> is it better to apply the external potential using the entire electrode as a whole, or would it be better to apply potentials to the layers separately? Okay, so probably this is related to the ideal metal behavior, I think. So your, your issue would be that um, if you do this to your um, whole electrode, then all of the charges will be accumulated at the surface of your electrode. But um, there's a thing called the Thomas Fermi model, model for the constant potential method. So um, this might be the better, better way to approach this. So this allows you to um, model non-ideal metals. So basically you put a penalty on, uh, on the charging of atoms. And then instead of the screening that's at the outer layer, or rather the inner layer of electrodes, the charges will distribute in, into the electrode. I hope this answers the question. Yep, thank you. Um, one more question. Uh, electrode package, rather than using electrode for an electrolyte system, how would could we use to employ it in a system containing a conducting polymer? Um, yeah, why not? I mean, I don't know how um, what properties you actually expect, so it's hard to say if this works for your system, but it's definitely worth a try. Okay, I got one more for you. Um, can we use this method for a cylindrical pore like a carbon nanotube? Yes, so uh, I forgot to mention this, but uh, there's actually a dipole correction for this. So there's not just the slab correction, but also in the wire system, a wire correction. This is uh, specifically for systems that are only periodic in one direction. And um, yeah, then you should have good chances to, to apply this. Great. Thanks very much again, Ludwig. Uh, with that, I think we can move on to our next uh, speaker and that,
will be Anders Johansson from Harvard University, and the title of his talk is Autograd versus Elbow Grease, comparing Allegro and Flair for performance portable extreme scale simulations. Anders, are you able to share your slide? Looks good. We can't hear you yet. Oh, can you hear me now? Now we hear you, but your slide is gone. Now it's back. Okay. Um, Take it away, yeah. Anders. So thank you, Aiden. Uh, I'm a PhD student in the group of Boris Kuczynski who gave the keynote earlier. So he talked a bit about machine learning potentials in general and then uh, our methods Allegro and Flare. So I'll be talking a bit more about the implementation details and how we can make these uh, scalable and performance portable. So the difference between Flare and Allegro is essentially a story of symmetry. So when you're doing machine learning potentials, you assume that the total energy can be written, for example, as a sum over the per atom energies that depend on the neighborhood of an atom. So all the neighbors within some cutoff distance, and then you pick your machine learning method of choice uh, to represent that per atom energy. And then it turns out it's not a very good idea to just throw atomic positions into an arbitrary machine learning model. And the reason for that is symmetry. So the energy should not change when you, for example, rotate or, or translate your structure as shown on the right here. Uh, and the way to counter this uh, has traditionally since the 1960s been that if you make the input to the model invariant, then the output will automatically be invariant. So think of Leonard Jones, which operates only on interatomic distances. Those don't change when you rotate a structure. And so the energy also doesn't change automatically. And then there are newer approaches like the atomic cluster expansion and the snap descriptors we heard about earlier. So here's an example on how to make three body atomic cluster expansion descriptors. So essentially they give this vector D that uh, for each atom describes this atomic environment in this fixed length vector. And then you put that into your favorite machine learning method and that gives you the per atom energy. So Flare is an example of this. You take uh, the atomic cluster expansion, you throw it into a sparse Gaussian process and that's your per atom energy. Uh, and then it's a Bayesian method. So it not only predicts the energy, uh, but also the uncertainty. So if you have some red training points shown on the right, then the model not only predicts the mean given by the solid line, but also the uncertainty given by the shaded area. Uh, and as you move away from the training points, the uncertainty increases essentially to show you that maybe you shouldn't be trusting your machine learning method too much. And then uh, um, at inference time, we can rewrite this kernel method with a sum over the training set to just a vector matrix vector product that is very fast to evaluate. And in particular, we make this fast by having a lamps pair style with Cocos acceleration. So Cocos, the accelerated package that Stan talked about yesterday, which gives us portable performance across hardware architectures. In, in particular, it gives us very good GPU acceleration. So we get this by doing multi-level parallelism. So we parallelize over atoms, neighbors, and descriptor components. This reduces the memory usage while also improving the efficiency for smaller systems so that you can take it full advantage of the massive parallelism offered by GPUs, even if you have a relatively small system of just a few hundred atoms. And shown on the right, we apply Flare to this data set from 2020, and we look at the error versus computational cost, and we see that all the invariant models are more or less the same in terms of accuracy, uh, but Flare is definitely among the better ones. Uh, and then in computational costs, Flare does very well on CPUs. And then on top of that, we have the GPUs, which really can give a big boost in performance. So shown on the left here, we scale Flare on 10 million atoms of platinum hydrogen, up to 16 CPU nodes with 512 CPU cores. Um, and we see that it's still slower than even a single NVIDIA A100 GPU. And then you can use many more GPUs to get really the, the best per possible performance. Uh, and this enables large length scales and time scales as shown on the right. So this can be useful for uh, applications such as heterogeneous catalysis. I don't know how good this looks on Zoom, but you have two red atoms bouncing around on the surface and uh, they meet up and leave as a hydrogen molecule. This is a rare event. So if you wanna see many of these and get good statistics, you need either large length scales, long time scales, or ideally both. So you really need the performance. And we can take this scaling to the ridiculous for benchmarks. So last year we did um, half a trillion atoms on Summit with 27,000 GPUs. Uh, and on the left, we have strong scaling and weak scaling on the right. And um, we see that we get very good scaling in both cases and only the performance eventually degrades because of a communication overhead when the fraction of time spent computing forces decreases. 
And until then, we have more or less perfect linear scaling, and we get very good weak scaling as a result. And the performance compares favorably to the previous large-scale benchmarks, such as uh, SNAP and DeepMD on the same machine. So then the question is, can we do better than invariant models? Um, the answer is yes, and that's where equivariant models come in. So I said earlier, it's a bad idea to throw atomic positions into arbitrary machine learning models, but it turns out it can be a good idea to throw atomic positions into a not arbitrary machine learning model, and in particular, equivariant models. So the equivariance refers to the symmetry of the features, so the vectors that get passed from um, layer to layer inside the neural network. So if you just do this uh, in an arbitrary neural network and you rotate the structure, then those features will behave in a non-physical way. They will neither be invariant nor equivariant. While in an equivariant neural network, you have uh, tensor features which transform the way they should. So you have rank zero tensors, scalars that don't change when you rotate the input structure. Then you have vectors which transform as vectors and so forth for higher rank tensors. And then only the final layer is invariant because we want to predict the energy. So shown here uh, are the vector features somewhere inside a, an equivariant neural network. So you take an atomic structure, you feed it through the neural network, and then you look at the features somewhere along the way. And you look at what the, happens when you rotate them. Sorry, when you rotate the input structure. And because of the way that equivariant neural networks are constructed, the features inside the neural network also rotate the way that they should, um, which requires a lot of math, but it turns out it works very well. Uh, so we can look at the accuracy. On the left here, we have a small molecule benchmark. We see that uh, in terms of error, all of these equivariant models with a green check mark perform essentially a, a discontinuous leap in accuracy compared to all the traditional invariant models. Uh, and they really are a lot better on pretty much all the benchmarks uh, we have seen. And which equivariant model happens to be best for a given data set that is more or less random? I happen to have picked one here where uh, Allegro, our model, looks best. But in general, all the equivariant models um, tend to perform better. And not only are they better in terms of accuracy, as so shown on the left, they can also be more data efficient, as shown on the right, where we apply an equip, an equivariant model, to the water data set of DeepMD, which has 133,000 structures in it. And then with an equip, we only need 133 structures to beat DeepMD by more than a factor of two in terms of accuracy. And so this sort of goes against the, the common assumption that neural networks need a lot of data because they are so massively over-parameterized. Over it turns out that uh, if you have equivariant neural networks, which uh, respect the symmetry, and so they have fewer ways to go wrong, and they um, are a bit smarter, they can actually learn more from each data point so that you need less than data. The, of course, there's no free lunch. You don't get this accuracy for free. Uh, and where equivariant models suffer is in terms of speed. So first of all, they are slower just from GPU to GPU. Um, but not only that, they are often hard to, to scale to multiple GPUs. So they are both slow on one GPU, and you can't use more GPUs to alleviate the problem. And this is due to the message passing that has been coupled to the equivariants in all the previous uh, equivariant neural networks, such as NEQIP and MACE and others. Uh, and the problem with message passing is that it increases your effective interaction range. So if you have, say, four layers with a five angstrom cutoff, then your effective interaction range is 20 angstroms, which requires either huge neighbor lists or some complicated communication scheme, both of which uh, are inefficient for scaling and sort of are at odds with the spatial decomposition that is sort of the core feature of LAMPs for uh, running large-scale simulations. And this is where Allegro comes in. So Allegro is the first equivariant neural network that is not message passing. And then the question was, well, what does that do to the accuracy? And thankfully, we see here uh, at the bottom that Allegro can achieve state-of-the-art accuracy uh, without the message passing. So really, it shows that the message passing was not the feature needed for high accuracy in case it, instead it's just the equivariance. So the message passing, we can just get rid of. Uh, on top of that, Allegro is very heavily optimized. So all of this is worked by Albi Musalian, our PyTorch wizard. Um, so Allegro is implemented in PyTorch, and you optimize PyTorch models by essentially avoiding PyTorch. So PyTorch has a just-in-time compiler uh, that tries to be smart but isn't when it comes to optimizing your code. Uh, so for example, when you do all of these tensor products, you have different rank 0, rank 1, rank 2, etc. tensors that need to be combined in different ways. This gives you a large number of small linear algebra operations, but if you just do naively a nested for loop over these, then PyTorch won't really understand how to make it fast. And so 
um, if you use the strider data layout that LB came up with, you can pack all of these tensor operations into uh, one big uh, tensor contraction that does all the tensor contraction paths uh, in one go in one big Kublas operations. And, and so it is uh, very efficient. Another way to avoid PyTorch silliness is to pad your input tensors. So what we saw when running molecular dynamic simulations is that it would take thousands and thousands of time steps before the performance started to, to plateau uh, and reach sort of the peak. Uh, and we found that this was due to large numbers of uh, internal memory reallocations occurring inside the PyTorch model and the PyTorch caching allocator. And so we found that if we just pad the input tensors by 5%, then we don't need to reallocate until the number of items or neighbors has changed by 5%. And then uh, you get a much more stable performance as shown on the right here. So with that and the LAMPS plugin, we're ready to do some large scale benchmarks. So on the left, we do different biological systems from 20,000 to 44 million atoms. On the right, we do water systems up to 100 million atoms. And we see that on problem water with 5,000 A100 GPUs, we can get to about hundred times steps per second for up to 1 million atoms. Uh, and the idea is that 100 times steps per second is a pretty good speed. It's sort of enough to do real science and it's not that much worse than the traditional non-machine learning approaches used in the bio community. Uh, um, and so while Allegro is slower, if you just look at the number of atoms and GPUs and time steps per second, then the traditional approaches, even compared to traditional machine learning approaches like the Annie neural network, Allegro does provide much better accuracy. Uh, and for some systems, you're going to need that accuracy. And so at least with Allegro, uh, you can throw more GPUs at the problem and get to uh, a reasonable speed. Uh, thanks to the scalability and the short range uh, neural network architecture. So the highlight of this was our ability to simulate a 44 million atom uh, capsid, so an HIV capsid. This is the 4 million atom capsid. And then um, in the simulations, it is solvated by 40 million atoms of water and ions. Uh, and we were selected as a Gordon Bell finalist this year, which we're very happy about. Uh, and we're also very happy that Allegro is able to simulate such a complex structure, even though it is only seen tiny protein fragments um, with DFT calculations of typically 50 to 100 atoms. So with that, um, in summary, Flare is a very fast invariant model that also has uncertainties in active learning, while Allegro is a slower but much more accurate model. Um, and essentially what you want to use depends on your use case and your requirement in terms of speed uh, and accuracy. So with that, I'm almost at 12 minutes. So I just want to thank the teams behind these codes. Uh, so on the Allegro team is Albi and Simon, who did all the architecture development, all the PyTorch code and so forth. And then I just came in at the end and wrote the LAMPS plugin. And similarly for the Flare side, we have the Flare team consisting of Yushi and Cameron Owen. And I want to thank my advisor, Boris Kuczynski, uh, as well as the computational resources around the country. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions either um, now or later on Slack. Uh, and yeah, thank you all for listening. And I'll just leave this summary up. Thanks, Anders. Um, do any of the panelists have questions for Anders? I've got one uh, in the Slack. It says, uh, have you ever tried to compare Flare with GEMnet, G-E-M-N-E-T? And not that I'm aware of. Uh, with Flare, we've compared mostly with the other invariant models and then uh, for an equip and Allegro, there's extensive benchmarks, uh, especially in the equip and Allegro papers, comparing to both the previous invariant models as well as the different equivariant models. Okay. If there are no further questions for Anders, uh, I'll thank him again, and we can move on to our next speaker. And uh, that will be Stephen Sanderson from the Australian Institute for Bioengineering and Nanotechnology at the University of Queensland. And uh, he is going to talk about MOLSLOT, a package for modeling homogeneous molecular flow. And the Hi, slide um, looks great, Stephen. And uh, we can see your, your pointer. It's a, it's a, it's a hand. And right. uh, yep. your audio sounds good. Take it away. All right, thanks. Um, I've just got a Zoom pop up right in front of me, but hopefully I can work around that. And um, I should say uh, thanks for staying up late. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's very early in the morning in Australia. Um, but no, the talk's been great. It's been worth the time. Um, 
so yeah, this talks about a package that we've been developing and it's still under development, so not quite ready yet. Um, but I thought I'd give a bit of details of what it is and why it's useful. Um, and if I can uh, zoom, there we go. Um, yeah, so um, this package is designed for modeling homogeneous molecular flow. Um, and where that comes in, if this will, there we go, where that comes in is in quite a few applications. Um, one of the big poster ones is for advanced manufacturing, where you might have um, 3D printing going on or um, injection molding. Uh, and you, you could have some very complicated mix here of things like shear flow, extensional flow, even rotational flow. Um, and if you want to model exactly what's going on, um, that's where you need this sort of algorithm. So you could do um, uh, boundary-driven flow modeling where you take two walls, drag them in opposite directions and watch what your fluid does. Um, or if you want to model the system out in the bulk away from any walls, um, so you don't have the effect of, say, a density profile caused by the walls on your system, um, then you really need a homogeneous algorithm. Um, and that's where SLOD comes in. So SLOD is an algorithm for modeling homogeneous flow with fully periodic boundaries. Um, and essentially we're applying a constant gradient to our flow velocity, um, U. And uh, so for anyone who's modeling or doing these sorts of models has probably heard of SLOD, um, but what they might not have heard of is where it actually came from. And I thought that would be a good introduction to um, why this package is so useful. So this equation is probably familiar as the Hamiltonian from which we can derive Newton's laws of motion. Um, and in 1980, Bill Hoover came up with a modified version um, where we take the uh, gradient of our streaming velocity that we want to impose. Um, and this Hamiltonian will actually produce that flow and it became known as the Dolls Hamiltonian. And that's because this QP tensor here reminded Bill of the QP dolls. So he decided to call it the dolls tensor. Now, this gives us these equations of motion here, where we have the update to the position being based on the peculiar or thermal momentum plus the streaming velocity. Um, so the, the position uh, dot product with the uh, streaming profile. And then the update to our thermal momentum is based on our potential, gradient of our potential, and this extra force, which is essentially an account keeping um, uh, force for thermodynamic consistency, make sure that our pressure is, or our, as the stress in the system is being applied to both um, kinetic and positional degrees of freedom. Now, turns out this works well for shear flow, um, but when you go to more complicated flows like um, elongation, then the having multiple non-zero components in grad U can end up causing second order effects and producing incorrect flow at high strain rates. So later on, there was an alternative um, where essentially they just flip this part around and that ends up giving the flow in our uh, correct flow in all cases. Um, but in this case, it's not Hamiltonian in general, but it is Hamiltonian in the case of a symmetric flow tensor. Um, and in that case, the Hamiltonian looks almost identical to the Dolls Hamiltonian, except the Dolls tensor has been reversed. We got PQ instead of QP. So obviously if we reverse the Dolls tensor, then this should be called slot or dolls backwards. So with the slot equations of motion, um, the one other thing we need for modeling a steady state system is a thermostat. And that's because this will be adding heat to our system. So we need to take it out somehow. And a popular choice is the Nozer Hoover thermostat, um, where we're applying a friction force to the thermal momentum. Um, so we can heat things up or slow, uh, um, cool things down in the kinetic degrees of freedom. Um, and that's responding based on some temperature set point. So with that, we can progress quite quickly to a steady state um, and model homogeneous laminar flow. Um, with the only other thing we need being boundary conditions that deform the, in a way that's commensurate with the flow. Um, essentially, you can think of it as integrating corners of the bounding box with the same equations of motion, except without the thermostat um, and obviously no peculiar momentum in that case. And all of this is implemented in LAMPS, um, has been for quite a long time uh, in fixed MVT SLOD, which uses fixed deform to handle the boundary conditions. 
or a bit later on for doing elongational flow as long running simulations without boundaries getting too close to each other, there's fixed uh, MVT UEF in the UEF package. Um, but if you just blindly apply these equations of motion, uh, you can run into problems. So there's an old paper by Dennis Evans and Gary Morris where they showed that even for simple Leonard Jones beads, if you go to a very high shear rate, you can end up with this spurious string phase forming. And the reason that happens is that by applying the thermostat to the flow profile we're imposing, we're essentially assuming that that is the flow, flow profile. So if in our system that's not the response that we get, maybe there's a bit of turbulence or something happening, then the thermostat sees this deviation in the flow profile as thermal motion, even though it's technically flow motion or streaming motion, um, and tries to correct it, correct it in inverted commas. Um, so this can lead to this spurious string phase, and it shows up as a kind of shear thinning, um, which they showed that if you use a profile unbiased thermostat instead, um, so one that calculates the streaming profile on the fly, you actually end up with shear thickening um, and no string phase forming. So very easy to get wrong. Now, turns out that molecular flow is another one of the situations where the standard thermostated slide algorithm fails, um, which is kind of an issue if a modern systems that we're interested in that want to deal with molecular flow. And the problem comes because when we have a flow profile across a molecule, that molecule is going to want to rotate. Um, and that rotational motion is part of the streaming velocity, but the thermostat doesn't know that. It just sees an atom moving like this and thinks that's thermal motion and tries to act against it, thinking it's too hot. Um, so the thermostat actually ends up imposing a torque and trying to suppress that rotation. So obviously that's no good. And it can cause some pretty serious effects, especially, again, at higher strain rates. Um, so here, this is a paper from Carl Travis and Dennis Evans, again, quite a while ago, digging into this. Um, and they show that you end up getting, again, shear thinning from the atomic thermostat, whereas a molecular thermostat lets you see shear thickening. Um, it also shows up in the molecular pressure tensor. So the molecular pressure tensor can be asymmetric instantaneously, um, but we expect it to be symmetric on average, but under atomic thermostat in SLOD, um, we actually end up with an asymmetric pressure tensor, and that's because of the, the thermostat itself applying torque to the molecules. So one solution would be to try to use a profile unbiased thermostat. Um, that does have a couple of issues. Um, firstly, instantaneously, it could still apply a torque to the molecules. Um, there's also a lot of free parameters to worry about, um, like what, how big you make your bins, um, what your averaging time is, and lots of things to choose from and lots of ways to get it wrong. So an alternative is to use a molecular thermostat. Um, and a molecular thermostat, essentially, instead of scaling or applying the friction force to each atom individually, we only apply it to the molecular center of mass motion. And we can calculate the temperature also from the molecular center of mass motion so that we don't see any rotation in that temperature calculation and we can't apply any torque with the thermostat. Now, the other part we can do is actually apply SLOD itself to the molecular centers of mass. And this we, we call uh, molecular SLOD. So with molecular SLOD, um, the one other thing to keep in mind for calculating the viscosity is that you should make sure to use the yx component of the molecular pressure tensor, um, since that's the most closely coupled to the response. Um, so this will give you the best, best statistics, either pyx or pxy, or the atomic pressure xy, um, will all give you the same result on average, um, but you'll get better statistics from molecular pyx. So that leaves us with three things to do molecular flow that aren't available in lamps yet, um, which is a molecular thermostat, molecular slog, and molecular pressure tensor. So that's where we come in. Um, and our group received a Pawsey Center for Extreme Scale Readiness grant um, for a project that will bring support for all of this to lamps. Um, and by we, I'm talking about Emily, Shern, Amy, and myself doing the main development work. Uh, Deborah is our group leader. Charlotte was involved in getting the grant set up. And Marco is our contact at Pawsey, who's really been helping us through all of this. Um, 
And the goal of the project includes going to quite large scales. So we're also working on including COCOS support. Um, so to go over the current status a little bit, uh, molecular slot and the molecular thermostat are working. There's some minor changes pending and a bit of cleanup sort of work to do, um, but the basic implementation is there. Uh, molecular pressure is also mostly done. We just need to include case-based support. Uh, COCOS acceleration is in progress. We're about 75% of the way there. Um, there's been some tricky problems to solve, particularly for the molecular pressure, um, but I think we've got a reasonable solution now. Um, and we'd like to also include compatibility with the UEF package if we get time, but that's still on the to-do list, so we'll see how things go. So with all that said, let's have a look at molecular slot in action. And here we're applying it to just a very simple um, system of five bead Feeney chains. Um, so essentially a small polymer melt. And first we can look at the viscosity and we see as we expect um, from using a molecular slot and molecular thermostat, we're able to see this shear thickening, whereas um, we're still getting shear thinning with the atomic slot. Um, and we can also look at the pressure tensor and as we expect, molecular slot is giving us this um, uh, symmetric um, molecular pressure on average, whereas atomic slot has this divergence between PXY and PYX. Um, so there is some torque being applied. And I just wanted to finish off with a slide about limitations. So it sounds like mole slot solves all the problems, but there are still cases where it doesn't work. Um, and this is a couple of them here. So on the left, we have buckyballs in water. And the problem here is that the C60s will want to aggregate, form clusters. And once they form a cluster, that's kind of like a molecule and the center of mass of the cluster might be moving with the streaming motion, um, but the cluster itself might be rotating. And that rotational motion of the cluster can be flow, uh, can be flow motion, um, which the thermostat doesn't know about. So again, you end up in the same problem. Um, somewhat similarly, if you do here, we've got large graphene oxide flakes, again, in water. Um, and in this case, there is some collective motion between the flakes where they want to stack up. But the bigger issue is that they also push around the small water molecules. So again, you have these water molecules that are rotating around the center of mass of this large cluster um, in some flow motion that the thermostat isn't aware of. And then the other one not pictured is if you go to longer polymers, you can also run into problems because the... Um, ends of the polymer chains can have motion that's quite decoupled from the center of mass. Um, and in that case, the thermostat isn't very effective at actually maintaining the correct temperature. Um, so you might end up simulating something that you don't expect to be simulating. Um, so to conclude, uh, SLOD has a lot of nuances, particularly when thermostats get involved. So take care and make sure you know what you're doing. Um, and most SLOD package is coming soon. Uh, to hopefully alleviate some of the difficulties there. And just wanted to end by thanking everyone on the PACER team, um, also Ming Chow in our group, who's been doing a lot of testing for us, Joe Schoonover from Fluid Numerics, who helped out with the code sprint last year, and Billy Todd and Peter Davis, who really helped get the whole thing off the ground. And thanks for, for your attention. Thank you, Stephen. That was a really interesting talk. Uh, I, I had a, a quick question for you. So how are molecules defined in, in all of these molecular methods? Uh, yes. So we've had to, under the hood, and this is a little bit subject to change, um, we've added a fix that kind of keeps track of molecules um, based on like the standard LAMP sort of molecule ID. Um, so it's similar to how uh, compute chunk um, okay. works and picks oh. out molecules. So it does a similar thing, but we'll kind of keep track of molecular properties so that we can share them a bit more efficiently between our styles. Okay. Um, another question, do you anticipate these um, features being useful for things besides uh, rheology? Um, it's a good question. Um, so I guess that there are rheological properties that you could calculate, well, sorry, yeah, you, you're generally doing these simulations to calculate rheological properties. Um, so things like viscosity, et cetera, um, whether that's of something you're normally 
using in rheology? I'm not sure. It's it's a good question. Um, I probably don't have yeah. a good answer for that. I, actually, I, I can imagine uh, other thermomechanical properties like, um, say, elastic constants of molecular solids uh, at, at temperature might uh, converge much quicker using your molecular ah, yes. pressure instead of atomic pressure. So that's I think that's an interesting thing that could be explored in the future. Yeah, good point. Thanks. All right. Um, let me just double check if there's any more. I don't see any questions in the uh, Slack for Stephen. Um, are there? Is does anybody else uh, on the panel have a question for Stephen? If not, then I think we can hand it. We, we can hand it over to our next speaker, which is thank you very much, Stephen. Which is an invited talk, and um, this will be given by Teresa Head Gordon. Teresa is Chancellor's Professor at UC Berkeley and also Senior Faculty Scientist at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. She has pioneered the development and application of atomistic simulation methods, both quantum and classical, to molecular liquids, macromolecular assemblies, protein, biophysics, and chemical catalysis. With that, uh, thank you very much, Teresa, for uh, participating, and uh, we look forward to your talk. Thank you very much for the invitation. I appreciate it and the very nice introduction. And so let me begin by um, uh, the, sorry, give me one sec. And so uh, play from, okay. Um, so I changed the title a little bit, um, and uh, but the but the general idea that I wanted to talk about today is this interplay between methods and software to be able to solve um, chemical problems, um, and to um, and to focus in particular chemical problems that involve chemical reactivity. And so that's what I hope to sort of introduce to you today, and also to kind of emphasize the. Um, the fact that you know codes like lamps are really helpful as we in the um, in the field of computational chemistry try to deal with uh, the general problem of the potential energy surface and the potential energy surface as we know is um, you know is pretty much laid out by um, being able to solve h psi equals e psi and this is a sort of a fairly well known uh, representation about um, the level of um, how one models electron-electron interactions in regards to accuracy. And these have sort of, you know, um, you know, on the order of order n cube scaling with sort of a pretty big coefficient outside of it, allowing us to solve, let's say, hundreds of atom um, type systems. And then to, um, up, you know, um, higher and more controlled approximations that give us more accuracy. Um, things like couple cluster um, or full CI, but that the size of systems essentially then has to decrease due to the computational cost. But there's another law that we should also care about, and that's the law of statistical mechanics. And that's where my group is focused on is not just gas phase chemistry, but also quite interested in um, condensed phase systems, which means that um, we have to be able to do this high dimensional integration to be able to extract ensemble properties. And when we do that, you can see that this, um, ob these observations are weighted by um, you know, something like a Boltzmann factor, which requires the repeated um, uh, you know, um, evaluation of um, this type of, of, this type of um, energy function. And hence, in order to be able to sort of then deal with, um, let's say, a time sampling domain, um, of somewhere between picoseconds to microseconds to milliseconds, which is where some of these observables are important, one has to jump down to uncontrolled approximations, traditionally um, called molecular mechanics. And what you get back from that is effectively a change in base in the system size that you can do and the amount of sampling um, that's possible. So this struggle, this tension between sampling and, and potential energy surface accuracy is, um, you know, is, is, what, is what computational chemistry is most fundamentally probably uh, focused on in regards to methods and models and software. All right, so we've lived a long time with the pairwise additive approximation. And uh, in the sort of, let's say in the molecular simulation, biomolecular simulation world, Lifson and Warshall in the early 1970s proposed that 
we treat covalent interactions as fixed. In other words, there's no chemical bond making or bond breaking, um, but fluctuations around equilibrium geometries that then are driven um, by, um, you know, systems are then driven mostly by intermolecular interactions involving something like Coulomb's law, um, Coulomb's law and things like dispersion and poly repulsion um, with approximate functional forms. And you, we all know this is probably wrong, but there was a lot to solve. And, it, and, and codes like LAMPS were, were right at the forefront of the fact that we had to be able to describe long range electrostatics. And so for a long time, the field was using cutoffs that get longer and longer, but eventually things settled down into being able to do Ewald or particle mesh Ewald and their variants. Um, but in addition to that, there was also um, the, the, the need to have symplectic integrators and to connect to experimental observables by being able to describe correctly uh, thermostats and barostats that lead to relevant ensembles like the canonical or the isothermal isobaric, et cetera. And then there was just system size effects. And so sort of struggling through finite size effects and how to uh, understand how properties are affected by simulations involving system sizes that are too small. And then finally, to be able to sample. And the sufficient sampling was necessary before we could even begin to define potential energy surface model errors and when they mattered, okay? So, all right. So that essentially then though was the recognition that, you know, once you've gotten most of that theoretical framework kind of reasonably solved, then um, one can start picking up on potential energy model errors. And we know that the um, potential energy surface is not pairwise additive. And so, you know, I go to the classic um, intermolecular uh, interactions book by Anthony Stone, and we can see that there are additional terms, um, things like polarization, um, which was missing from most of these pairwise interaction force fields. Um, many body dispersion, and when one really needs high accuracy ac calculations, overall pairwise works pretty well. And just quantum mechanical effects that are sort of important at short range, um, things like charge penetration and charge transfer. All right, so, so having, and so what this is representing over here is just that sort of the short range interactions that are very anisotropic, where all of the quantum mechanical accuracy is necessary in order to get good intermolecular um, descriptions of the potential energy surface. All right, so my group has been um, moving forward on trying to move the community away from these pairwise additive force fields. And there's lots of reasons to like them. And one of the reasons to like them is that they kind of are more transferable. They kind of work when you pull them off the shelf and apply them to something new. And here's just an example, an early example of where um, I was working with some experimentalists who had um, looked at amphiphilic peptides in water and showed that you can concentrate them up to two molar and they never phase separate. You know, they, just say, they say solvated. And if you take a force field like, um, and this is just a label, the black is meant to indicate a pairwise additive force field, you see that they aggregate, they phase separate. Um, but then you just take something like a polarizable model, and what it does is essentially then show a radial distribution function, okay, where um, the peptides are um, are uniformly distributed um, with a solvation shell around them, and that didn't require any explicit parameterization to actually show that. Um, here's an example of in a in a terahertz experiment that we did um, in collaboration with another theorist, Dominique Marx, just showing that there's a feature of intramolecular hydrogen bonding uh, dynamics um, that's captured with a many body potential. And if you turn off that polarization, it disappears. Um, here's where we applied with Martina Havana's group electric fields that um, that is a pump probe experiment showing that, um, a polarizable model can reproduce an ab initio calculation of that observable, okay, as opposed to a pairwise additive force field, which can't. And then working with Francesco Pisani, water draws a lot of crazy water theories, and that, you know, having good quantitative models of, um, of if many, which inquires many body interactions, um, they, uh, you can refute those crazy water theories. Okay, so... Here's though the bad, which is that 
the um, amoeba model um, that seemed to work good, works good in certain contexts. This is just simply showing here that if we actually start breaking down, if we just do the mini body expansion and we're looking at dimers and trimers and asking how um, it agrees with something called energy decomposition analysis. And energy decomposition analysis is largely a quantum mechanical theory or model that says that the quantum mechanical energy can be broken down into the piecewise components um, that we actually use in force fields. You know, so what part is permanent electrostatics? What part is charge penetration? What part is, um, you know, poly and, and dispersion? Um, and it turns out that that while the total interaction energies of amoeba might be actually pretty good, okay, the actual breakdown into let's say um, you know polarization or when we include ions, then those kind of interactions are off. They're stuffed in the wrong places, okay. And so, you, as a minimum, computational chemistry has to rely on cancellation of errors if you're missing physics, but it's not doing that. Uh, and in fact, it's doing it imperfect, imperfectly, as um, shown by Omar, who's now at Oak Ridge, and then Weji, who's now an assistant professor at San Diego State. All right, so my my first message to, to this group is to say that the days of empirical force field fitting, I think, are over, which is that this is a very principled approach to how we should go about developing force fields, which is to, to combine the many body expansion with EDA. So the idea then is that dimers have certain you know, components or percentages or fractions of uh, poly or electrostatics or how to model charge penetration. And if you do that for dimers and trimers and up to let's say pentamers, then you pretty much have a model, um, a functional form um, where we have sort of let's say empirical valence where again, there's no reactivity, but some kind of functional form for poly uh, and dispersion, um, permeable electrostatics represented as a multipole expansion and then um, polarization. And the MB pole model, which is well, really well known, I think it's implemented in lamps and is um, highly utilized if you want to study water of any, water in any sort of phase or uh, as long as it's just pure water, um, has essentially buried all the complexity of the many body into these, um, these uh, polynomials. Okay, So even though you have explicit representation of polarization, all the other many body effects like charge transfer, et cetera, um, charge penetration, um, many body dispersion, all of that's buried here in these polynomial fits. And so um, it doesn't make it very transferable. Um, and so what we did was develop the MBUCB model, but this time, um, you know, in interaction with EDA. And what we get then is then being able to decompose, let's say, polarization components accurately on these um, on these cluster models. Okay, so then the so anisotropic polarization, which we found to be important, charge penetration and charge transfer. And this is what you get. So what you get then is that by just simply um, you know, developing an EDA approach based on the many body expansion, we can get almost perfect water properties. You know, this is as good as MB pole, um, but with now a functional form without fitted polynomials that's going to be able to let us do ions in water or proteins in water, et cetera. Okay, so that's sort of the, but but the thing about this is that you would think everyone's going to be rushing to use these wonderful new models. And the reason that you don't get large segments of the community doing that is because they're too expensive. So um, amoeba is about a factor of, let's say roughly 10 compared to a standard fixed charge force field. And then you take MB pole, and it's about a factor of 50x, okay, compared to amoeba. Um, the MB, MB UCB model is probably about a factor of 10x as well, just like amoeba. And like I said, which is because of the sampling problem or the system size problem, a lot of people don't want to, to actually spend um, their time uh, waiting for calculations to finish. Okay, so then what, what is the problem? Well, solving the many body um, solution to something like polarization. Let's take that as an example. And, um, and so there have been these formulations that 
um, Andres Nicholson had led um, with um, when he was looking at Born-Oppenheimer molecular dynamics about treating the electrons as auxiliary degrees of freedom. And the first kind of the idea was to say that um, let's come up with a way to make a good initial guess for an SCF solver, okay, to be able to, um, you know, to, to, to evolve the extended Lagrangian to solve the polarization, or the, the, in that case, the many body electronic structure problem. So Alex in my lab um, decided to take this, this idea and extend it though to classical force fields. And so what I'm showing here is the extended Lagrangian where um, here we have the kinetic energy um, and the potential energy of our system, including polarization. And then the auxiliary degrees of freedom have a corresponding um, kinetic energy term as well as a harmonic potential, okay, that keeps it on to the, um, you know, to the solved SCF um, surface. And so this is a little bit different than Carr Perinello in the sense of that pesky mass term, right, which is that controls how big of a step size you can take, but the bigger the step size you take, the less that you satisfy um, staying on the born Oppenheimer surface is then taken in this limit where it's no longer a parameter. And that parameter means that you recover the original F equals MA, and this is then the corresponding um, F equals MA for the auxiliary degrees of freedom. All right, so what we did is it took, took this initial idea that this was going to solve the SCF um, for our auxiliary dipoles, okay? So there was a way to formulate an extended Lagrangian so that we could reduce the cost of being able to do a many body potential like let's say amoeba or MBUCB. But we found a problem, which is that, and so, so the idea of this too is that, you know, with a good initial guess, a good time reversible initial guess, you should be able to sort of um, loosen up Okay, um, you're, you're, that the convergence will con still con loose convergent will still conserve energy, and therefore consume fewer SCF cycles. And so you can see that if I just had a standard SCF solution, and then the more loose that I, you know, solve those um, SCF um, equations, then what I can see is that you know obviously with loose convergence, energy con conservation goes out the window, and that's why we don't do it. That's why we try to tightly converge to something like in units of Debye, something like 10 to the minus six. All right, so here is the extended Lagrangian SCF. Um, and what we can see is that it looks, it, you know, it, it does what's promised. I mean, when you get too loose, then things start off pretty rough, but overall, you know, energy is conserved and that looks good. And look at this time scale. So here we're about, you know, we've been able to simulate for a nanosecond. All right, so even though we're not conserving energy, the number of SCF cycles, it's a stable algorithm. The number of cycles that is required to solve is sort of a constant, okay? But when this extended Lagrangian SCF, what we discovered was that the solution was becoming unbounded. In other words, the number of SCF cycles just kept increasing and increasing and increasing has convergence, even at tight convergence being a problem. And the reason for that is I think that, you know, Anders, who's trying to solve Born-Oppenheimer molecular dynamics with quantum chemistry, just was never able to reach these time scales to actually see this kind of behavior. Okay, so this is a classic problem of what's known as resonance, which is that there's a coupling between this fast time scale, okay, of the auxiliary degrees of freedom, Okay, and so that's what that's what this is being shown here. These are the auxiliary dipoles and essentially how they, you know, how they oscillate in time um, based on this harmonic potential. But the real degrees of freedom, the real dipole is decaying on a much slower time scale. And so this coupling of this sort of this fast dynamics with the slow dynamics manifest as a buildup of kinetic energy. So this is the kinetic energy of the auxiliary dipoles that just simply increases. And so that means that that corruption of the dynamics is what's leading to the increased number of FCF cycles that are going to eventually increase without bound. And so our solution to that was to just introduce temperature control. And one can, and, and since it's an auxiliary um, 
system, you know, we're not thermostating the ions. We can even use something like Berenson, which has no known um, limiting ensemble, or we can nose, use Nose Hoover chains. And so when we controlled, um, the, we thermostated the auxiliary degrees of freedom, then we get recover good energy conservation at loose convergence and therefore reducing the number of SCF cycles has promised um, down to about half where the um, auxiliary is used as an initial guest for just finishing off um, the SCF cycle. All right, now the thing is we wanted to get a little bit more ambitious. Um, I, I actually didn't sort of present this, but we also ended up being able to solve the problem of not doing any SCF cycles at all um, for the many body polarization. And that's because it turns out that you really don't have to solve the SCF tightly at every step, which is remember I showed you that slow decay of the real degrees of freedom. You can pretty much then, you know, minimize your number of SCF cycles um, with an approximation of just this harmonic potential that keeps you on um, the Born-Oppenheimer surface. Okay, now, um, so then what we wanted to do now is to move toward reactivity, and therefore we want to work with reactive force fields. And reactive force fields are probably the worst of both worlds, right, which is that they're not true quantum chemistry, and they're much harder than force fields. But nonetheless, if you could solve this, it really deals with the current problem of, of essentially being able to, to deal with the expense, the expense of ab initio molecular dynamics. And so here's the reactive force field reacts FF. And I worked with a wonderful group, including Stan and, um, and uh, Jason and a bunch of others um, who were part of the LAMPS community, along with Audrey Van Dyne, um, on a new LAMPS implementation that also brought in some new methodology. And so just for, the, for those of you unfamiliar with REACTS FF, this is the bonded term, okay, all up here. Um, and then the non-bonded interactions are essentially decoupled completely, okay, from this bonded term. Okay, so we're not going to mess with this too much right now. But we thought, you know what, we can actually improve this non-bonded term there's a sort of a standard Van der Waals model, probably 612, 714, something like that. But the way that it treated electrostatics was through this electronegativity equalization method. And that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about today, is that it combined this method combines permanent electrostatics, charge transfer, polarization, all into sort of one functional form. And the problem is what I was saying earlier, which is that when you've got some potential energy surface and you can't really test it, you can't sample, um, then it's really hard to kind of decouple the sampling problem from the force field potential energy surface problem. So therefore what we wanted to do was to essentially speed up what was the rate limiting step in the evaluation of REACTS FF, and that's this um, rate limiting uh, evaluation of the many body um, uh, EEM uh, electrostatics. All right, so what is it? Okay, well, um, these charge rearrangements are going to be manifested as these second order Taylor expansions with respect to change in potential with respect to charge. All right, um, and so there are connections to DFT developed by PAR, later taken advantage by um, Goddard et al. Um, that it's essentially saying that we can connect some of these properties, okay, these derivative properties to things like electronegativity and atomic hardness, okay? All right, and then what you're gonna do is that you're gonna postulate that the electronegativity of all the atoms have to equalize, okay? And then in addition, solve um, under the constraint of whatever the charge of the system, which is typically charge neutrality, okay? so. So you've got two equations and in and 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 these unknowns, and you usually solve this self consistently. And so what Itai decided to do was to take again the same idea that we had developed for polarizable force fields, and create an extended Lagrangian system involving these um, these charge rearrangements. And so now Lamps has a reason for why it actually implements um, the. Uh, EEM model this way, but it actually breaks up things into these sort of S-related and T-related charges. So we formulate then uh, two harmonic potentials involving those um, decompositions. 
and then solve the equations of motion um, by setting those masses um, to zero, recovering F equals MA for the atomic degrees of freedom and the extended Lagrangian. And again, what we did was to essentially use those as initial guesses to be able to reduce the number of SCF cycles. All right, now the first thing that you may want to notice here is that energy conservation is terrible and it's not because of the lamp cementation, it's not because of the extended Lagrangian, it is just the nature of the REACTS FF model that actually had something called a tapering function that actually was truncated too harshly and, and therefore resulted in, in energy conservation problems. But nonetheless, what we can see is that with our extended Lagrangian SCF solution, um, we were able to control, we were able to reduce the number of cycles. So here's the original uh, one for whatever the system is, I've forgotten, is a reactive system. Um, so we've essentially been able to reduce the number of iterations by half. Okay, so that was um, good and, and allowed us to sort of move forward. And then I had a brilliant um, uh, visiting undergraduate, Song Chen Tan. And he worked with um, all of us, including Lin Lin, um, who's a applied mathematician at UC Berkeley, and Jin Feng, um, who's at Duke, and um, and uh, An, who is now um, Dong An, who's now at UCLA. Okay, so then Itai and Song Chen and all of us worked together on now just eliminating SCF cycles altogether, and so. What we did is to formulate charge and the chemical potential has latent variables and then also enforce holonomic constraints to satisfy the charge conservation. And when we did that, what we were able to do then is to take the original model and reduce its computational uh, cost um, by you know, at least sort of a factor of five to 10. And what we can see is that properties are well conserved, whether I'm using this stochastic extended Lagrangian for the EEM or whether I'm doing the conjugate gradient uh, versions. Okay, so, but the still problems with EEM as a model, as a model potential energy surface, it's unphysical. It has charge transfer at long distance when it's known to be a short range interaction. The charges are required to be centered on atoms and they therefore can't polarize. They um, don't dissociate into integer charge fragments, and there's no out-of-plane polarization, et cetera. Okay, and then here's the electrostatic potential, and we can see that the EEM model compared to, let's say, charge partitioning methods used in QM, you know, it's just very error-prone. And so Nancy and Itai, um, in particular Itai, um, the, Nancy and Itai worked together to show this, this effect, and and Farnes was essentially responsible for the MBIS model. Um, and so Itai said, you know what, let's just throw in, let's forget about um, EEM. Let's go to a coarse grain electron model. And it's just a classic core shell model, which is that, um, you know, nuclei are treated um, as these cores. And then what we do is we have dissociable shells representing the electrons. And so we have a functional form involving electrostatic energy and a Gaussian, which we can think about as equivalent to Pauli. And then to recognize that we can describe now an extended uh, charge distribution um, to describe um, the electrons that have the conceit of, of conforming to the ionization potential and the electron affinity of any given atom, of any given element. All right, so these ideas extended and we ended up developing a reactive force field um, model for water. In other words, so now it's REACTS FF, FF where we've replaced it EEM with CGEM. And what we can see is that we get lots of improvement on just properties like um, temperature dependence of the, uh, the temperature maximum density, um, the, the transport has a function of temperature, and then basic um, dissociative properties and things like been able to describe eigen and zundel complexes um, of, of hydronium and hydroxide, um, all those kinds of sort of kind of a, a step toward describing chemical reactivity in bulk liquid water. And we applied it to something called microdropic chemistry. This is a hot topic right now. It's a very controversial, which is that if I just spray water, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an interface and there's believe that that interface gives rise to speeding up chemical reactions by many orders of magnitude, somewhere between 
two on the modest side and up to factors of six to eight orders of magnitude for, uh, for certain organic reactions. And no one knows why it works, um, you know, which is that, is it, is, it, is it the interface or is it maybe a gas phase channel that's near the surface? Um, could it be that there's these droplets essentially cavitate and create large energy sources for uh, reactions? Do all reactions get accelerated? Do they have the same mechanism? And so what Hangsha and Itai did was to take the Reaxf CGEM model and to then actually analyze electric fields as a hypothesis about what's different at the air-water interface. So Wei Min um, and Dick Zer, uh, had actually developed a Stark measurement, um, and they calibrated this Stark probe to say that they think that the measured electric fields is about nine megavolts per centimeter. I will just tell you that that's actually a little bit too small to perform chemistry, but you know you need something like about an order of magnitude um, more than that to be able to do reactions. But it's essentially it's a it's a benchmark, experimental benchmark for what the electric field looks like at the interface. Um, as opposed to the bulk. All right, so what we did is to then, and, and you know, we, we did this in LAMPS, um, which is that we developed the Reaxf CGEM model that we then used to simulate this large micro droplet. And what I'm showing here is that the interface shows these charge density fluctuations. And those correlate then with electric field variations whose average, which I will cut to the chase down here, is in, probably really fortuitous agreement um, with, the, with the experiment. But that's not the interesting part, which is that it's not the average that is so interesting. It's the fact that the fluctuations at the surface give rise to a non-Gaussian, a Lorentzian shape of electric field strengths that are an order of magnitude than what you see in the interior of the, of the droplet. Okay, so, so that's, our description of what's going on is that the interface gives rise to electric field fluctuations um, that could drive chemistry. And to illustrate that, we have a very simple model where we're calculating the bond dipole, let's say, of the water molecule at the air-water interface um, to characterize then electric field projections onto the OH bonds that happen to be a third of them are essentially sticking out into the air. And when we project onto those, then we get a free energy lowering of about two kcals per mole. That makes a lot of sense to me because these are not enzymes. They're not electrocatalytic systems. They're micro droplets that have modest speed ups. And therefore, that's about two orders of magnitude speed up. Let's say if one was to break the OH bond um, and or the, to extract an electron, let's say, um, to be able to form um, radicals that can go on to, let's say, form hydrogen peroxide. All right. You, so you have uh, you have four minutes, including questions remaining. Okay. All right. I will I will quickly um, finish this up. Okay. All right. So I knew I wasn't going to have time to to get further than this, but that's okay because this story ends right here. Um, by saying that we do think that these fluctuations are then responsible for the electrostatic process that we're going to drive chemical reactivity. Now, I'm going to just simply then highlight something um, so that I have time for questions to say where we're heading to next is, of course, um, where everyone is heading in regards, um, uh, you know, tackling the, the time scales and the expense of ab initio molecular dynamics. And another way to get to the penitential energy surface is through machine learning models. And we have developed this equivariant machine learning model um, called NewtonNet um, that you know does a lot of things, a lot of things well, which is one is to reduce data requirements, and that's important because the data is expensive, and to do this with high accuracy. And so we've done this, and I just want to sort of by end by saying right here, I'll stop right here to say that. Um, to really replace and really compete against ab initio molecular dynamics with machine learning has got a long way to go. And Nancy here has um, been able to essentially show what you have to do to really make this work, okay, for something like hydrogen combustion. And so I'm going to, if it may be offline, can answer questions about it. Uh, this is a paper that will be published in Nature Computational Science showing that there has to be a really tight coupling in the software between the QM and then the active learning procedure 
and the machine learning models, and that those have to be tightly coupled in order to really solve this problem of being able to, to do a chemically, chemical reaction um, or chemically reactive system uh, with a machine learning model. Okay, so I will leave you with that teaser. And of course, you know, 900 slides, which was completely unrealistic, but, um, but and also just to simply say, we've also auto-differentiated the model twice to get Hessians. And it turns out that that's actually turning out to be really, really excellent. We're actually sort of able to show that and this time working with Sela um, and Judith uh, Zador's group, that we're able to essentially now do transition state searches with factors of two to three uh, fewer steps um, with these machine learned Hessians. And I will um, end there by saying that I think all methodology has to deal, in, at least in the chemistry space, with the dual goals of quantum and statistical mechanics. And I've talked to you a lot about this, and I just wanted to say that something like LAMP's um, software, and we're actually also developing some new software, but I just wanted to say that I'm a great admirer and consumer and developer of LAMP's and, and, and really genuinely appreciate it. And I'd like to also then show appreciation to my group. And I hope I mentioned everybody that needed to be mentioned and then also to make my fun, uh, funding sources. And I'd like to thank you all very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa. Um, we have time for, for one or two quick questions. Does anybody on the panel uh, with audio access, uh, have a question for Teresa. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Teresa. This is Stan. Um, just was wondering when you use when you replace the EEM with the CGM, do you have to reparameter parameterize the full Rex FF model? Um. So Sam, yes, which is that. We are, so yes, yeah, so the answer is yes, yeah, CGEM had to be reparameterized, but also um, we did some reparameterization of the bonded part. But the other thing I really, really, what I will say is that we are also starting to now focus on the bonded part. And that means that we're, um, uh, we're starting to think about, in fact, we are working on learn, doing machine learning of the bond order. And that, and therefore just kind of, ignoring some of the functional forms like the overcoordination, the undercoordination, um, to, to put it into the bond uh, order energy term and all those terms, like all the valence terms um, by a machine learned bond order. So what I'm just trying to say is that yes, we're turning to that, that part of the, of the model. Thank you. Um, there's a question on the Slack. Uh, it asks, will fluctuations of the electric field increase for higher temperatures? What about zero Kelvin? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I mean, so the answer is, um, if things are pretty static, you got about 10 megavolts per centimeter. And I don't know if anyone's going to be able to get down to zero, right? But I'm just saying that, yeah, it's a temperature effect for sure, um, um, almost by definition. I, I had a question about the uh, energy decomposition analysis. I, I had not uh, seen that um, uh, raised before. It, you, is it, I guess my, the question I have is, um, is it possible for a, an effective potential of any kind, like, like amoeba or something, to um, how problematic is it that it does not match the EDA, EDA as well as it matches the overall energy? That's a really good question um, too, because I'm saying that overall, let's say um, electrostatics, I think are captured virtually perfectly. Um, when you describe it with um, charge penetration and permanent electrostatics. Um, but eventually when you get, you know, into, into, well, anyway, so let me just sort of continue by saying charge transfer is a difficult one. So we haven't really found a good functional form that allows us to sort of capture charge transfer. Um, and then, like I said, at very, very, very short range um, where, you know, atoms are overlapping and, or, you know, at that point, one should be doing quantum chemistry. So I'm saying these, these have to remain non-bonded 
so far they've been non-bonded interactions. Now there's been a new EDA that Martin's group has developed for how bonds break. And that's going to and eventually, not now because it's not fully developed, will eventually guide how we deal with something like React FF. Okay, great. Well, uh, we are over time. So thank you again, Teresa. And uh, we're going to move on to our next talk. And that will be, um, let me see here, given by uh, Hayden Rogan of the University of Edinburgh. Fix abrasion, plastic wear of arbitrarily shaped surfaces and particles in lamps. Take it away, Hayden. So, hello everyone, I'm Hayden, a PhD candidate at the University of Edinburgh, and today I'll be talking about the implementation of a new fix abrasion in lamps. So, it's well documented that the shape of granular materials may change through the process of abrasion. As particles interact with each other and their surroundings, material can be removed from their surface, thus changing their shape. Consequently, these changes can go on to affect the bulk dynamics of the granular system, or it may be undesirable for certain products to abrade during processing, with their functionality being closely linked to their shape. That being said, the current LAMPS implementation does not allow robustly for this abrasion and its subsequent effects to be captured. Therefore, this project aims to develop a LAMPS fix capable of simulating the abrasion observed in large-scale engineering systems. This requires large numbers of particles to change shape as they interact with each other and their surroundings. Whilst the current focus is on the individual particles themselves, which we're considering as one type of discrete closed surface, we believe that the methods developed will be extendable to other applications. There's hope that eventually we'll be able to apply the fix to simulate the abrasion on the inside surfaces of processing equipment, such as pneumatic transport pipes or cyclones. As a note, the approach taken here to simulate the abrasion is a continuation of previous work conducted at the university. And if you're interested in any of the specific mechanics, which in the interest of time, we won't go too deep into, uh, this paper here is an excellent resource documenting the foundational method for plastic wear of flat surfaces. So the first step to simulate abrasion is to represent our particle surface in lamps. To do this, we're starting with an SDL file, which describes the surface mesh through a series of vertex coordinates and connected triangular facets. Currently, we're generating these by projecting a pre-mesh cube onto the surface of our particle. In this short video on the right shows how the mesh is preserved as we transform its vertices down to the surface. The benefit of using an SDL is that because it's such a common a common format, the users will have the flexibility to generate their own particles and surfaces however they wish. So to import the particles into the simulations, we convert these STL files into the LAMPS MOL file. This conversion sees rep uh, vertices represented by discrete spherical atoms, edges by bonds, and facets by the angles data structures. On the right, we have an example MOL file generated from arbitrary STL and it lists the number of atoms, bonds, and angles we're using to describe the surface of our particle. This means that outside of just representing the particle shape, all of the topology information stored within the STL file can now be accessed within LAMPS. And since we're only using these structures to store the shape of the particle, both the bond and angle styles are set to zero, so during the simulation they exert no force on the atoms they are connected to. So now we have the particle surface in lamps, we can start to change its shape to simulate abrasion. To do this, we displace atoms, which are placed at the vertices, inwards along their respective normals. As the atoms are pushed inwards, this decreases the overall volume of the particle and represents a removal of mass. These surface normals can be calculated within lamps since we're essentially storing the particle's mesh within those bonds and angles. By displacing these surface atoms, we're not directly simulating the material that is removed, uh, but from a mass balance, we can readily quantify it through the total volume decrease before and after displacement. As a rather important note, this also exemplifies that we're only simulating surface abrasion and not fragmentation or the generation of separate smaller bodies. The wear is only simulated by um, displacing atoms inwards to reduce the volume of the particle. That being said, realistically, not every impact will result in abrasion. 
Therefore, atoms are only displaced when they experience a force exceeding a characteristic material hardness. This sets a threshold that all incoming impacts must exceed in order to abrade the surface. And this hardness is inputted into the fix as a parameter and is split into a normal and tangential component. And this allows abrasion from both normal and oblique impacts to be simulated. These two hardnesses are used to determine the material's resistance to indentation from a normal impact and also scratching from a lateral impact. This diagram gives a brief overview of how surface atoms are displaced in both cases, and notably for the uh, lateral impact, the surface atoms shown in red are still displaced normally to the particle surface and not to the impacting body. This is in an effort to avoid the formation of large gaps between atoms as the particle abrades. One caveat is that this method doesn't allow for the buildup of material on the leading edge of the impact, which acts to decrease the surface's resistance to scratching since we don't have a volume here resisting the impacting particle. However, the hardness can be scaled and corrected to account for this. In terms of numerical inputs to the fix, there are only two which need to be defined. It's the normal hardness and also a friction coefficient, which is used to calculate the tangential hardness. As a note, these diagrams are taken from the original paper I mentioned in the beginning, which describes the plastic work of flat surfaces. A full list of equations on how these dis uh, displacements are calculated uh, is given in that paper if you're interested. So this approach developed for the flat surface has been successfully expanded into a new fixed abrasion for a single stationary particle in lamps. This short video on the right shows the uh, fix in action, where we have an incoming sphere impacting the surface of our particle with enough energy to cause abrasion. Consequently, the pressure which is exerted on the individual atoms exceeds that material hardness, and those atoms are displaced normally to the local surface. After the impact, you can see that the particle has reduced in volume and undergone a permanent change in shape. Uh, for demonstration purposes, the hardness here has been set very low, uh, to exaggerate the abrasion, where in reality, a much smaller amount of material would be removed per impact, with many repeated impacts being needed to gradually abrade the surface and significantly, uh, significantly change its shape. As hinted, the fix not only displaces these atoms, but it also calculates the required normals which they travel along. Visualized here is the same simulation, we're showing the bonds in gray and also the calculated normals in green, and following the impact, the mesh stored in those bonds and angles also deforms, and the surface normals are dynamically updated by the fix in lamps. These are calculated as an average of each atom's surrounding facets normals weighted by their area. This updating of normals is crucial because on subsequent, uh, subsequent impacts, atoms will be displaced in accordance with the new shape of the abraded particle. This means we can simulate a change in particle shape following repeated impacts over a longer time scale, with atoms always moving to reduce the particle's volume. And this simulation here shows just that. We have a particle in the center represented by a shell of atoms meshed with the bonds and angles, which is being repeatedly bombarded by spherical grains of a similar size. Following these impacts, the atoms are displaced normally to the surface, and the particle reduces in volume and undergoes a rounding in shape. Now, as I note, the impacting particle here is shown in blue, is currently just a finite sphere. In the final implementation, we aim to have this replaced by a particle which can also abrade. So we've seen there's definitely a change in shape as a result of the simulated abrasion, but does it evolve in the way that we'd expect? To answer this, several shape parameters were tracked across the course of the simulation. As you can see in this figure, as we removed volume from the surface of the particle, both the convexity and the sphericity were found to increase. You can see this directly in the change in shape too, with a lot of the features present in the original particle being smoothed out as it's abraded and it approaches an ellipsoid. Crucially, this behavior is in qualitative agreement with literature for a particle worn by an object of a similar size. Outside of literature, this may also agree with what your initial intuition says. In fact, we often observe this type of behavior in the world around us. A good example is that of pebbles on a beach or in a river. As they move and churn and bump into one another, the surface is worn away or abraded. This results in a rounding of their shape, and I hope you can see some uh, analogies between the simulation results on the left and some of the images of the pebbles on the right. 
The fix, however, does come with its limitations, as you've seen. Currently, it's limited to a single abradable uh, particle, which is fixed in space. To overcome this, we need a way to identify collections of atoms as particles and also get them moving so they can abrade with each other and their surroundings. Of course, fixed rigid seems the perfect fit, but one modification we need is how we go about um, calculating the inertia, since we're representing continuous particles through a hollow shell rather than by a filled collection of atoms. We've identified a method to correctly calculate the inertia through a hollow shell, and that leverages its topology, which, as you recall, we can now readily access within lamps through the bonds and angles. And so we can visualize each of the particle's facets as being connected to the particle's center of mass, which we set as a common origin. And by considering all of the particle's facets, we define a series of tetrahedra making up the entire body. The inertia of each of these can then be calculated and summed about the center of mass to emulate the inertia of a continuous particle. These changes have been successfully implemented into a new fixed rigid shell in which we cycle through angles in the body uh, of the particle rather than atoms and sum the inertia of the tetrahedra as mentioned. This graphic on the right shows the two hollow shells of atoms successfully falling under gravity using this new inertia. Currently, the rigid body dynamics are isolated from the fixed abrasion. And so future work will aim to join the two systems together to simulate large scale systems of dynamic abradable particles. But hopefully you can imagine that um, as these particles hit the floor and each other, their surface atoms could be displaced using the fixed abrasion. And since we have access to the updated shape within lamps, we could once again cycle through the angles and update their inertia. Thus, we can account for the effect of abrasion on the dynamics of the granular system. Uh, once this is complete, multiple particle simulations will be verified against lab scale data in an effort to give qualitative as well as quantitative verification of the fix's final performance. So to conclude, a new fix abrasion has been successfully implemented into the lamps for a single stationary particle. Initial tests show um, the fix has qualitative agreement with literature for a particle abraded by a similarly sized body. Future work, which is currently in the way, aims to expand the fix to allow large scale systems of dynamic particles to abrade with each other and their surroundings. And once we've developed this, we believe it could be expanded to simulate the abrasion on any arbitrary shaped surface. As mentioned, this work builds on the methods developed for the plastic work flat surfaces. So I'd like to thank Rosario Capoza, Kevin Hanley, Kevin Stratford, David Scott, and James Young for their initial developments and continued support. And I think we still have time for some questions. And if not, feel free to contact me by email. And again, here's that paper, which has a full list of equations for how we're displacing the atoms. Thank you for Thanks. listening. That was a very nice talk. Um, I, I, there was one question in the chat that I'll, I'll read out to you. Um, mm -hmm. If I understand correctly, atoms are displaced to modify shape, but there is no erosion. So particle mass would be conserved and density would keep increasing. Is that correct? Yes, so we're only displacing surface atoms. Um, the intention is, uh, as we move these atoms inwards, we can track how much volume has been removed from the particle, uh, and we tr track the mass of the particle as being a body attribute, not an individual atom attribute, uh, if that makes sense. So we could so, but there is the, the question is, like, should you be representing actual removal of particles, or is that not a problem? Uh, in reality, abrasion is removal of material, but the way we're representing that is by removing volume, by uh, pushing atoms inwards. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and with that, uh, I'll thank Hayden again, and we're going to move on to our lightning talk section. Um, so Stanmore made this look really easy this morning. I'm going to try to make it look hard right now. <laughs> uh, let's see. First, uh, we have to uh, Hayden. If you could unshare, that would that would be helpful. Uh, I guess I can just override you, perhaps. Uh, nope, Hayden, you're going to have to unshare yourself. Yep. Apologies. Working on that now.
Thank you. And uh, our first speaker is uh, Jyoti Roy Chudori. Jyoti, are, are you uh, present? I heard a rumor that you might not be here. Um, if, if not, then we will move on to the second speaker. Uh, so I think I can now start sharing. Let's try it. Aiden, I don't see the name show in the panelist list. Could you say that again <laughs> louder, please? I don't see the name in the list of panelists, so we move to the second. Okay, one. all right. So I'm just I'm struggling to find the the window with the the slides. Nope, that was not. Uh, maybe it was the right one. What am I looking at? Oh my gosh. Uh, Did someone tell me which window I'm sharing? <laughs> yeah, we can see the, the PDF. You just need to make it full screen. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Uh, so I just need to put it in slideshow mode. Enter slideshow. Okay. So uh, Dr. Jyoti Roy Chaudhuri is is not here. So we're going to move ahead through his slides. By the way, the title of his talk is Dynamic Response of an Aqueous Nanodrop with the Underlying Substrate of Varying Wettability. We're just gonna step through that. And now we're at the second talk, which will be given by Tanju Shah from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Uh, take it away, Tanju, you have three minutes. Um, hi, I'm Tanuj. Uh, I'm a PhD student at uh, RPI, and uh, I'm going to present a talk on uh, predicting liquidus lines in binary molten salt systems. Uh, just before I actually start, uh, I think this is, I think uh, Aiden has actually done similar work in 2011, so this could be considered a um, follow-up. Uh, but uh, right, uh, next slide, please. Um, oh, I can advance this. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I oh, forgot it was me. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so uh, just a brief overview. So uh, molten salts uh, have been proposed to be used as uh, coolants and the uh, kind of solvent to dissolve uh, fission products in for SMRs, small modular reactors, and also for thermal storage systems. Typically, um, these, uh, these are mixtures of multi-component salts. Uh, and uh, Generally, people use things like CalFAD uh, to make predictions of the phase diagram, uh, knowledge of the liquidus lines on the composition temperature space allows uh, reactor designers to know what compositions and temperatures uh, can be safely used. Um, however, uh, CalFAD depends upon experimental data. Um, and we can alternatively use molecular dynamics to obtain the free energies uh, between phases. Um, and we can uh, use the common tangent construction to obtain compositions and temperatures of equilibrium between solid phases and the liquid mixture. Uh, we can find these free energies uh, using thermodynamic integration, uh, which is which I'll talk more about in the next slide. And uh, we have prototyped this methodology. Oh yeah, we've prototyped this methodology using the model binary salt of uh, sodium chloride and magnesium chloride. And uh, yeah, we are using the Fumitosi model uh, the rigid ion model to do this. So over here, I'll just discuss uh, kind of the pathway. So thermodynamic integration uh, is essentially a technique to, um, essentially what you do is you transform between some defined start state and some defined end state. And uh, you introduce a parameter uh, lambda into the potential energy function. And you can kind of be a bit creative with how you do this, uh, depending on what your start state and end state is. Um, in this case, what we do is we do a bulk transformation of the of the entire system uh, from, uh, essentially we start from whatever the model is. So either a machine learned potential or in this case, the rigid ion Fumitosi model. And the final state is an ideal gas, uh, which essentially is uh, just no, no interactions between particles. And uh, we essentially do an intermediate step where we convert it to a Leonard Jones fluid. This is primarily because especially later when we use a machine learned potential, uh, 
sometimes um, when you're scaling down the interactions, uh, a lot of these machine learned potentials do not necessarily learn a kind of repulsion, atomic repulsion that's kind of built into the functional form of something like, like a 612 potential. Uh, and so that's why this intermediate Leonard Jones fluid step is, is necessary. Um, and so uh, once we do that, we can obtain the absolute mixture free energies of the liquid. Uh, and so the kind of uh, TI curves for the first step along this transformation are the curve on the, sorry, are the um, plot, is the plot on the top right. And uh, that's converting the Fumitosi fluid to the Leonard Jones fluid. And the bottom right is converting the Leonard Jones uh, fluid to the ideal gas. Um, Anuj, you have 30 time. seconds to wrap right. it up. All right. So most of the transformation comes from this first step. And the, and the key is uh, we also need to obtain the relative free energy of the solid phase, which we do this by obtaining uh, from knowledge of the melting point of the solid phase. So uh, next slide, please. So we have some initial results for the Fumitosi model. Uh, so. Uh, on the left is uh, we're, no, we're not going to have time to go through this of the solid. Yeah. So essentially, these are initial results for the Fumitosi model. Uh, the predictions are the black squares. So we have some agreement with experiment. And I just want to mention that we also have some initial results for the machine learned model, which is which captures a curvature of this phase boundary a bit better. Um, Great. And I Thank you, Tanuj. Kind of time. Yeah. Thanks. And our next talk will be given, I believe, by Marco Gallo. Is, is that correct? Yeah. Can you hear me? Um, you're very low. Can you um, make it louder? Yeah, let me see. Yeah, is this? We uh, cannot hear you. Can you hear me? No. No. Barely. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me or not? You're going to have to shout. <laughs> yeah. Let me see. Now, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, Go. just go for it. Okay. Yeah, the, the focus of this work is the removal of aromatics uh, sulfur compounds from oil fuels, such as diesel and uh, gasoline, and gasoline to reduce uh, air pollution from toxic gases. Uh, these sulfur compounds are com converted to sulfur dioxide upon combustion occasionating health effects such as respiratory, cardiac, and neurological disorders. And are precursors of acid rain eh, affecting the ecosystems. The clean technology used for its removal consists on the extractive solvent desulfurization using ionic liquids. Ionic liquids are comprised of cations and anions that are in a liquid state at temperatures below 100 Celsius. By selecting a particular combination of ionic uh, parts, you can design uh, solvents with specific properties. The figure one on the left side uh, shows uh, yellow charged spheres attached to uh, core non hydrogen atoms by a harmonic spring representing root oscillators. The size of the yellow spheres on the leg of the spring has been exaggerated for visualization purpose. Next slide, please. Many of the classic and force fields developed in the literature do not consider polarization effects, giving rise to inaccurate solvent shells, coordination numbers, dielectric constants, hydrogen bond length, diffusion coefficient, etc. Professor Padua recently developed polarizable force fields that you can see on the table on the left that gives good agreements against volumetric, energetic, and transport properties. Next slide, please. Free energy perturbation using replica exchange molecular dynamics were carried to determine that, uh, that solubility of thiophene within four imidazolium ionic liquids at infinite dilution at room temperature conditions. These um, four ionic liquids were selected based on uh, ecotoxicity effects, viscosity values, and uh, depth available studies in the literature. Each alchemical window was considered a replica, and Monte Carlo exchange occurred only between adjacent windows every 1,000 integration steps. 
the result obtained in, in our simulations show that the anions interact closely with the thiophen than the cations and the bigger anions such as tetrafluoroborate and acetate display higher solubility, aka larger negative, negative free energy values uh, compared to chloride and bromide anions. You're almost and, out of time. Eh? Oh yeah, that was it. Thank you very much. Our next talk is by Abhiskar Bhusal from the Physics Research Initiatives, Nepal. Thank you. Hi, my name is Abhiskar Bhusal. I am from Physics Research Initiative. Today, I'm going to present my research on estimating minimum miscibility pressure, that is MMP of cell oil and CO2 in organic nanopores using CO2 of amp of molecular dynamic simulation. Next slide, please. Next, okay. So talking about, no, no, please go back. So sure. talking about, sorry, talk, talking about the MMP, it is a, one of the critical parameter uh, required, required in the designing of CO2 of NPOP simulation. Uh, it is basically the lowest pressure after which the oil molecules and the CO2 becomes one phase, uh, thereby increasing the diffusivity and hence maximizing the oil recovery. So in our uh, research, we used two graphene slits to model oil reservoir. Uh, we used octane molecules to represent the cell oil. And besides, we use the United Atom model for both the octane and the CO2 molecules. So basically, our simulation is divided into three parts. The first part is half. During the half procedure, we injected the carbon dioxide that is uh, purple in this, in this diagram uh, into the pre equilibrated oil reservoir by, by the help of the graphene piston. And we lay, lay uh, the oil molecules and CO2 to equilibrate for some time. And then after, after that, we proceeded to uh, the prop procedure in which uh, the oil is uh, uh, led to come out from the oil reservoir. Uh, and we uh, consider the, the number of molecules which comes out of the oil reservoir to be recovered. Uh, next slide, please. So as you can see in the figure number two, uh, when the injection pressure is increased, the oil recovery goes on increasing, uh, but up to a certain threshold pressure after which uh, the oil recovery plateaus. Uh, we actually use the... Aiden, we can't uh, see the slides. Sorry. Uh, and we use two regression lines uh, by considering the point above and below the threshold pressure. Uh, and we consider the meeting point of these two lines to be the estimated MMP inside the cell oil nanopore. Actually, this is the quite popular method to uh, calculate MMP uh, while doing the experiments. So as you can see uh, in the figure number three, the MMP, uh, uh, MMP increases with the rise of the temperature. And as you, you can also see that the, the MMP inside the nanopore is lower than the bulk MMP. This is due to the confining effect of the slits. And besides the oil recovery increases with the uh, temperature. Besides, you can see in the figure number four, uh, with the rise of the uh, slit height, the MMP force decreases. And then after some uh, certain threshold height, that's five nanometer. In our case, the, or the oil, oil recovery as well as the MMP uh, increases. So uh, in summary, uh, we use the CO2 of n molecular dynamic simulation to calculate the MMP inside the cell nanopore. We found that uh, the oil, rec oil recovery as well as the MMP increases with the, with, with the temperature. Uh, and with the, with the slit height, the, oil the MMP force decreases then after some uh, certain threshold three types, the star string piece. So these people are my acknowledgements. Thank you. Thank you, Abhiskar. Our next talk is by Syed Shuja Hassan Zaidi. Yes, Go thank ahead. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for pronouncing my right uh, my name uh, right, correctly. So in today's I'm audible. So I'm audible. Yeah, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, so I will be talking about surface electric spinal decomposition. So to begin with, I will uh, quickly uh, give a brief overview of what is spinal decomposition is. So uh, 
we have about we we know about this common phenomenon of phase separation where uh, which are present uh, as a liquid liquid phase separation in cells or in intergalactic media also so when we have system with multi components uh, some you know so for for many cases we have the, you know the let uh, let we can do the simple binary mixture uh, having uh, a and b type of particles so in this uh, spinal decomposition what happens Okay, uh, that uh, the growth or the fluctuations or the composition ratios they go uh, spontaneously. So uh, in the stage diagram, I'm uh, in the stage diagram on the y-axis we have a three scale temperature and on the x-axis we have composition ratio and we can see uh, similar uh, a mixture uh, which is homogeneous at certain temperature and we can we point that system to a to a state point in the stage diagram where the uh, the system likes to be in a phase uh, segregated system, phase segregated uh, uh, system, also in a, in a demixed state. So we have a mixed state and we have a demixed state. So uh, so how how the demixed state during this panel decomposition the domains improve in time? For example, on 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 the, on the right, I'm showing the temporal evolution of uh, a Carl Hemingway model. Where we model the state separation using the free energy functional, and that free energy function has three important components. The first one being the uh, the, uh, the main field theory uh, functional, which is the function of order parameter. And the second uh, term is the equivalent gradient of the order parameter, and the third term is uh, my static noise. So, how those have one minute remaining. So, you go up from yeah. So next slide, please. So uh, during the space separation, what happens if we uh, add any inhomogeneity or inhomogeneity in form of surface function in form of wall? So uh, with the, the phase separation happening in the, uh, in the in the mixture, if we add if we add a wall, then the interaction for the interaction with the wall, they may uh, if the wall has a difference to some a type of particle, then it may happen that that uh, the wall is completely wet by a particular component. For example, in this uh, figure, uh, with this magenta, with the center wetting layer, and then after magenta wetting layer, we have a, a face, face separating wall. So, I had your time so, is up. Oh, oh, thank you. Is there any, any last words? <laughs> uh, so, uh, the, the idea of this uh, uh, presentation was to uh, in the uh, system where we have a pattern substrate instead of a simple wall, if we have a different chemically pattern on the surface and how, because of those chemically pattern, my birth morphologies change, which is highly okay. useful We're in to, the thin 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 there Because we got to move on to the next talk. Thank you, Sayed. Thank you. Looks like interesting work. Our next talk. Yes is from uh, Gonzalo's, Gonzalo Dos Santos from the Faculty of Engineering at Mendoza University. Actually, it's not Mendoza, it's, yeah, it is University of Mendoza. Yes, Are yes, you, it is. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you the, for, the, for the opportunity. First, I want to acknowledge some of our collaborators, among whom we have had the privilege to collaborate with some lunch and it has been a great boost to, to our work. So basically the, the spin package of LAMS uh, enables spin lattice dynamic simulations, which are basically a combination of molecular dynamics and spin dynamics. Spin lattice dynamics couples the atomic and spin degrees of freedom through this uh, distance dependent uh, Heisenberg function, J of far that is there in the Hamiltonian, enabling the study of the influence of several mechanical properties on the magnetic behavior of different systems. Uh, as a first example of what can be modeled with these uh, dynamic simulations, I want to share some results of, of one of our latest projects, that is uh, magnetism under compression in BCC iron. Uh, here we have compressed uniaxially along the crystallographic duration 100, three different iron samples, a single crystal, a polycrystal, and a nanophone. And we have monitored the magnetization evolution during the compression. 
For the single crystal, we find that during the elastic phase of compression, magnetization, the black curve increases, closely mirroring the evolution of the uniaxial stress, which is this magenta curve. This increase is caused uh, basically by two factors. The average nearest neighbor distance is decreasing during the compression, and this increases the Heisenberg exchange interaction. And the other, the other factor is that the average coordination also grows uh, due to a larger number of nearest neighbor atoms. And then near 11% strain, we observe C to ATP phase transition with nearly 75% of the sample become an ATP, which produces significant disorder, mostly from irregular phase boundaries, but also from some dislocation curves. Here, the material expands. Yes, sorry. You have one minute. Okay. The material expands and the um, lowering the magnetization, which now assumes uh, values below the initial uh, ideal crystal. Interestingly, the effect of compression in, in nanophones, you have there on the right, is minor since compression proceeds mainly by porosity reduction and filament bending rather than by ligament strength. The last uh, slide, please. And finally, uh, I would like to show you some recent results. There is a loop on the effect examples that highlight the role of. Here, we have simulated with spin lattice dynamics a defective uh, iron nanoparticle. You can see there it's a twin and a few vacancies uh, under an alternative magnetic field and compare this result to that of the pristine nanoparticle simulated under a spin dynamic simulation or like a frozen lattice approach. We observe large differences between pristine and defective nanoparticles and find that defect leads to larger magnetization fluctuations as you can see quantified there by the magnetization system. This reduced saturation field and generate much smaller stereoscopic loop area, as you can see uh, on the left on the stereoscopic loops, approximately one quarter of, of that of the pristine. Thank Furthermore, you. our coercive fields agree reasonably well. And okay, this, this shows, I mean, the importance of spin lattice dynamic to help understanding and optimizing magnetic properties for real material with different. Let's move on to the next talk. Let's see. Oh, is that the last? That is the last talk. I think I, I was the last one, yeah. Yeah, OK. Well done. Thank you uh, to all of the Lightning Talk speakers. And uh, that concludes the second uh, part of day two of the LAMPS workshop. Stan, are there any uh, final announcements? Uh, no, I think just uh, we'll be back here at, uh, uh, I think it's 9.50 Eastern, right? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, yes. I believe that's, I will just double check that. Yeah, 9, 9.50 Eastern, correct. Okay, thanks everybody. And we'll, we'll see you again tomorrow.